Post Tenebras Lux After Darkness Light. Hello, hello. I see several of you are already here, raring to go. In fact, Melissa is here, and that means she's playing hooky from Dr. Dalcor's class. So nobody tell on her or on me for uh, pulling her in this direction. <laughs> uh, and Eric asks if I have spoken lately with Alex, that's a friend of mine in California, and I have not. He moved, which doesn't make much of a difference since I already live on the East Coast, but he moved within California from one place to another. And uh, I think some of his activity has changed, but I know that uh, Dr. Dalcor has been in touch with him, and I think he attends the Bible studies on Wednesday nights that... Uh, Eddie teaches. So I know that he's around and doing well. He just hasn't called me in a while, but uh, hey, hey, thank you. Thank you so much. Slam, a moderator, and she's giving me an unnecessary super chat. She already labors for you all uh, being a mod, which frees me up. I don't have to pay that much attention to what's happening in the chat while I'm teaching until the breaks. Uh, so She's already performing an invaluable service. So thank you, Slam. Thank, thank you, thank you. And thank you to my other mods. I think I have other mods here. Um, so tonight is the night that I advertised. In fact, I do have to apologize because on the one hand, on Sunday, I kept saying I'm going to do this on Wednesday. And then I guess I must have set it up wrong in the scheduling program on StreamYard, so it was scheduled to go up on tuesday so a lot of people showed up on tuesday thinking that's when i was going to teach and uh again i i said the right thing on sunday but i put the wrong thing in when i set this up on StreamYard. so i had to change it and i know that jack had uh i guess bought a bunch of um channel memberships and I don't exactly know how that works when somebody else gets them, how others uh, acquire them from the person. So I hope everybody was able to benefit from Jack's generosity. And I thank you, Jack, for that. Sorry for the uh, confusion on the schedule. Um, oh, uh, somebody's telling me that I forgot to check my audio is there an audio issue is anybody else having a audio issue truth defender says rogers always forgets to do a mic test he does forget he does forget but uh okay it's good oh you just you just want to be a heckler okay okay tg just wants to wants to bully me uh, interrupts says, do you know of anyone who has done a verse by verse study of Proverbs, like the way you break things down, or maybe you can do it? <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know of anything on YouTube or necessarily that's available on something like sermon audio. I, I imagine there is something on sermon audio. I haven't looked what I do know. And what I would recommend are the lessons that were taught once upon a time by Dr. Greg Bonson. Dr. Greg Bonson was a incredible Christian man and scholar and pastor and so forth. And he also was a PhD in, or had a PhD in philosophy and was a uh, swift logician. So his study on the book of Proverbs would be highly recommended as far as uh, stuff on Proverbs in book form. Uh, the last thing that I read on Proverbs that I would recommend, it, it's not exactly a book by or a verse by verse study of Proverbs, but 
it it talks about the structure of it. It does talk about the message and the contents, but it, it doesn't aim to turn over every verse. And it's a book called The Christ of Wisdom, written by O. Palmer Robertson. In fact, ironically, I have a book here by Robertson. It's a different book. It's called The Flow of the Psalms. Uh, but this is the same author who wrote the book, The Christ of Wisdom. He wrote a bunch of other books like The Christ of the Prophets, The Christ of the Covenants. And so The Christ of Wisdom is another installment on those books that he wrote. And so I would recommend that. Uh, let's see, what else can I think of off the cuff on the book of Proverbs? I, I can't really think of something that goes into it in detail that I would recommend besides those lessons by Dr. Bonson, if they're available. So I don't remember the link, but I do recall that once upon a time, Dr. Bonson's stuff was held under lock and key and the people that had the rights to his material were charging people for it lamentably. Uh, it used to be sold by Covenant Media Foundation, but then Bonson's family, I believe, got the rights from them and then made all of his stuff available for free. And there is a site out there that has made all that stuff available for free. So I would go on there and look for him. He's got hundreds and hundreds of lectures and sermons and uh, all sorts of things that uh, I think are invaluable. And so did his family and they were right. And so they made them available and they're online, but I, I just don't remember what the link is, which shows you that I'm not availing myself of that resource. Now, no truth is I used to get the, the tapes way back in the day. I, I met some people that went to his church way back in the day, back in the early 90s. And they came to our church with boatloads full of tapes. And so I used to listen to them. They were put out by Mount Olive, or I think it was Mount Olivet, or Mount Olive Tape Ministries or something like that. So I used to listen to them on tape. All right, interrupt says I'll do that. Yeah, so look online. I, I believe they're free. All right, with all that said, let's get into this. So as usual, I'm going to read the verse, and right before I do so, just a reminder of what sort of kicked this off for me. So this is a text of scripture that I've always loved. It, it has always had a measure of value for me, and by that I, I don't mean that I esteemed it as anything other than the Word of God, but in terms of how much I understood from the passage and how much I derive from it, it, it there's always been something uh that the verse has always uh, proved to be of benefit towards. And that at the same time, over the years, the verse has grown in my understanding. It, uh, and therefore, also, it, its benefit has enlarged to me. And most recently, I was doing something, writing a response to some material in Gary Machuda's book, which is an argument for the Apocrypha to be received as a deuterocanon, that is a second canon, that is something that should be received as inspired scripture, along with the proto-canonical books, the books that have always been received in the church. Now, e even calling them deuterocanonical shows you that something is afoot, right? There's something problematic here. He's recognizing, at least in some measure, that uh, these books have not always been as widely received as the books that I'm referring to as proto-canonical, the actual canon of Scripture, the 39 books of the Protestant canon, the 22 books of the Jewish canon, which are grouped differently and therefore enumerated differently, but it's the same books, same content. Uh, so I was looking at something, and one of the things that I saw was he was trying to make an argument for the Book of Wisdom. The book of wisdom is not to be confused with the Proverbs of Solomon, which talk about wisdom, nor with other wisdom literature like Ecclesiastes or the Song of Songs. Those are all identified as wisdom literature, at least in some context. That's the genre in which they're included. And uh, so he was making an argument for this other thing called the Book of Wisdom, which is an interesting book. It, it's a intertestamental book. It's pseudepigraphical, which means it's falsely ascribed to Solomon. Now people will call it the Book of Wisdom, but it had 
before been called the Book of Solomon, but nobody thinks that false description is true. And so most people avoid calling it that today because they don't want to give away the store. By calling it the Wisdom of Solomon and recognizing that it wasn't written by Solomon, you're acknowledging this book is pseudonymous. It is not written by the person that it pretends to have been written by. Uh, and you can see in Wisdom 9, for example, how the author pretends to be Solomon, but it couldn't be Solomon for a number of reasons. Number one, it was written in Greek. It is patently late. It was written, in fact, uh, by most scholars' lights in Egypt. And there's just a, a number of other problems that make it untenable that it could possibly be by Solomon. And so that false description already debunks the book. You know, you can't say that a book that puts itself forth under the name of somebody that is not actually its author, uh, that that's the sort of thing that properly passes for divine revelation, right? A, a duplicitous book uh, putting itself forth uh, in the name of God just doesn't fly, at least not for Protestants. It might for Roman Catholics. But anyways, what Machuda said, Machuda made this claim, and I, I don't want to get into the whole thing. I'm writing an article on it, and you'll eventually see that, but if I explain the whole thing to you, then I got to go into that whole thing, which is a rabbit trail. But, but here's the gist of part of the argument that his whole claim hinges on. He claimed that a passage is being cited in Matthew's gospel that has in view one who is the son of God. And it's not Psalm 22. Okay. So he doesn't want it to be Psalm 22. He wants it to be the book of wisdom because there's a passage in the book of wisdom that makes reference to a son of God. And so he wants this statement in Matthew to be referring to that. And so he says it, it can't be Psalm 22 because the one in view in Psalm 22 is not there identified as the son of God. And when I saw that, I thought how remarkably stunted I don't believe I've gone over Psalm 22 with you all, but I can assure you that Psalm 22 is about the Son of God, not just in some broad sense, you know, like, you know, connecting five different uh, dots, you know, you can get to his identity as the Son of God. I mean, the Psalm itself identifies that figure as the Son of God. That's a topic that'll have to wait another time. But in the course of that, I was thinking about a number of texts related to that whole topic and Proverbs 30 came back up in my thinking and I realized a bunch of connections with Proverbs 30 that I hadn't noticed before and so you're all now about to benefit from that so with that said let's let's read the passage first let me share my screen All right. All right. So this is Proverbs 30. The words of Agur, the son of Jacquet, the oracle. The man declares to Ithiel, to Ithiel and Ukal, Surely I am more stupid than any man, and I do not have the understanding of a man. Well, one thing we can say about this person already is he's not arrogant or full of pride, right? Surely I am more stupid than any man, and I do not have the understanding of a man. Neither have I learned wisdom, nor do I have the knowledge of the Holy One. Who has ascended into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name or his son's name? Surely you know. Every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words or he will reprove you and you will be proved a liar. Two things I asked of you. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. How different this author is from the author of the book of wisdom in the Apocrypha. <laughs> Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I may not, or that I not be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. And thus ends the reading of God's inspired and life giving word. 
All right. So as I'm sure you noticed, if you hadn't before, this text makes reference to a figure and his son asking what is his name or his son's name. Now, we're going to look in detail at the text, but I think it's evident from the rhetorical questions that are asked in verse four who the his is here. Right. When it says what is his name, it should be evident from the questions that the his here is a reference to the Lord who has ascended into heaven and descended. Surely this can only be the Lord. And even if you thought that there might have been one or two exceptions to this, when it says who has gathered the wind in his fists, well, then all questions that were remaining are now uh, chased away. Only the Lord has gathered the wind in his fists. In fact, this kind of language is found elsewhere in Isaiah, in uh, Jeremiah, in the book of Job. This, this language of who has done this sort of thing. The idea is only the Lord. Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Again, only the Lord. Who has established all the ends of the earth? The answer is the Lord. So when it says, what is his name or his son's name? Surely you know. Well, the answer is that his name is the Lord, and therefore his son is the son of the Lord. Now, having said that, still leaves the question open, what kind of son are we talking about here? Um, and before delving into that any further, I, I want to make some observations about this text. First of all, notice that the text makes reference to the words of agar. Now, the term for words here, it's a form of the word davar, and there's nothing fancy about this word. It's the common term for referring to the words of anyone. So it's an indiscriminate term. It, it can be used for men. It can be used for angels. It can be used for God. Just referring to the words of agar doesn't point to their significance. You'd have to know from some additional information, uh, either a general knowledge about agar, which we don't have. We don't have anything outside of this text about agar or words from the context that would you know, push the envelope further. And, and we do have further indication from this that these words are to be ascribed the greatest of significance because not only are they called the words of agar, so they are the words of a man. Right, but they're further referred to as the oracle or an oracle of this man. Okay, so these words are more particularly referred to as the oracle. Now, this word uh, doesn't have to refer to prophecy, but that's how it's ordinarily used when uh, it's being ascribed to a person and has specific reference to what he's speaking. I mean, the, the literal meaning of the word is. It refers to a burden, okay? So it doesn't have to refer to words, but when it does refer to words, well, then it's, in that case, typically a marker for prophecy, okay? And the reason a prophecy would be referred to as a burden is because it's something laid upon a prophet to speak. A prophet is burdened with this. He's obligated to speak it to God's people. Moreover, because the word is often weighty and is a word of doom in many cases, it has that added significance, you know, that added reason why it would be considered a burden. Okay? It's a burden in the sense that the prophet must speak it. It's laid upon him to speak. He has to unload this burden, and it's a burden because what he's speaking is hard and may well result in persecution for him. But we see it being used in many places as prophetic uh, you know, indicator. Uh, for example, in 2 Kings 9, when Joram was shot in the heart with an arrow, uh, Jehu said this happened according to the burden or the oracle which the Lord had spoken. Uh, you can also, if you're looking for another example of this word being used in this way, uh, in Habakkuk 3.1, it, it refers to the oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw. So there we have the, the prophet Habakkuk delivering an oracle. But if any doubt was still remaining in your mind that this is a prophecy, the next word puts it beyond all question. Okay, Here it uses the word na'um. Na um. 
uh, and it could be translated the utterance of the man or the declaration of the man. And what makes this word very interesting and very odd as well, I mean, the, this whole thing really starts to become very odd in a sense when you realize this is the book of Proverbs, right? It, the, the genre is not per se prophetic, though the Proverbs are from God, they're wisdom from God. They're not prophetic in the sense of being oracular, uh, of being, uh, you know, something that the Lord is saying that goes beyond, you know, just wisdom and penetrates to matters of great depth and even involves an eschatological element, right? It, something that points to the future. That, but that's what is going on here. So you don't expect this sort of thing to be found in the book of Proverbs. Now, I'm going to show you in a moment that the book of Proverbs does this not once, but twice. We'll see that in a moment. But uh, this word utterance here makes it very clear that this is prophetic speech because the word is used. It's not that the word is unusual in the sense of uncommon. It's used hundreds of times, but that's just the, the issue. It's used hundreds of times with, with God as its subject, right? Everywhere you see this term, except in two other places, it always refers to an utterance of God. Whenever you see the phrase, the, the declaration of the Lord, or declares the Lord, or the utterance of the Lord, it's this word. Okay, Hundreds of times it's used, and only on three occasions, this one and two other occasions, is it used to refer to a human being. And so here you have this idea that this one, this man, is uttering words, but these words are not just the words of a man, but they are inspired utterances through this man. Okay, so this is prophetic speech and in an altogether unexpected place. All right, hold on a second here. I think I, uh, all right, I want to pull up something real quick here for you. Um, I forgot to add this. All right. Okay. Okay. Whoops. Whoops. If David Wood were here, he would say it's amateur hour. Anthony always messing up. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So there's something about this second line really the, the whole line here that uh causes a great deal of angst for translators and interpreters i'm not going to try and resolve the issue right now i don't think it's necessary in order to show you the stuff that i want to show you but i i do want to sh alert you to it just draw your attention to it the the second statement here, really the whole thing, notice there's a bunch of names here, right? It mentions Agur, it mentions Yahweh, it mentions Ithiel, and it mentions Uchal. Okay, so you have four names here. And because of the next statement where it says, surely, that's key in Hebrew, uh, the word key, it, it usually indicates something that follows what has already been started, right? So it, it's not the beginning of something. The, the way it reads in this translation is like it's the beginning of the oracle. He's he's telling Ithiel and Ukal that he's about to give this oracle, but the oracle begins in verse 2. The problem is in Hebrew, this word doesn't typically begin something. It It is following it and explaining something that has already been started. And so what this means is for a lot of translators and, and commentators th that there's a problem with rendering the verse as though it's just a string of names, right? Agur, the son of Jacha, uh, writing to two people named Ithiel and Ukal. So for that reason, scholars have sought different ways of understanding this. And one observation is that if you take out the 
vowels of the cons of, of the Masoretic text, which were not original. Th those are not part of what was written down by the sacred penman, right? The author of scripture. Those were included by the Masoretes to facilitate, to aid people in reading, especially those who were not native Hebrew speakers. But these reflect their traditional way of understanding the text that had developed at that point. And they're not necessarily infallible. That is their, their, their way of understanding things. And so on occasion, the consonants can be understood differently, not always. And there's different ways you can determine which one has the greater weight behind it. But even then, it, it's sometimes difficult. Well, in any case, in, in, this, in this situation, these words, uh, the word Ithiel, that's only used as a name one other place. I think it's in the book of Nehemiah. But it means God is with me. And Uchal is a way of expressing um, being consumed or at an end. And so for that reason, you have, and notice, this is not just me pointing this out. I mean, it's you find it in various translations. What they do is instead of rendering it as a, a person referring to those that he's talking to, it's taken as a sentence. So the New Living Translation says, I'm weary, O God. I'm weary and worn out, O God. Uh, the English Standard Version says something similar. I'm weary, O God, and worn out. Uh, this Berean Standard takes the first occurrence of Ithiel as a name, and then it takes the following reference to Ithiel and Ukal as though he's making a pun off the name Ithiel and saying, I'm weary, O God, and worn out. Uh, you have the same thing in other translations. The God's Word translation, literal standard version, and majority standard Bible uh, say, I am weary and worn out, or I wearied myself and am consumed, or I'm weary, O God, and worn out. Uh, in the New American Bible, even uh, the name where it says uh, the words of Agur, son of Yahweh, uh, instead of understanding the phrase that is translated as oracle, it takes it as a way of, because the, the word is masha, and it takes it as a way of him identifying himself as a masaite, which is a descendant of Ishmael. And so this is a way of indicating this person's ethnicity and, and not a reference to these words as an oracle. Now, the, the fact that it's prophetic would still remain because it's, still got the word for utterance there, right? It's the word neum, which is used to refer to an utterance of God uh, hundreds of times. But in any case, you, you see the point that some of these translations, recognizing the way Hebrew grammar works, that there's something wrong with taking verse two as the beginning of the oracle. And so you'd kind of have to do something with verse one other than take it just as a reference to the people that he's talking to. Okay, now, this, this is interesting in light of some stuff I'll show you in a bit, but uh, I'm not trying to resolve anything here. I'm just alerting you to this. Okay, so we have this very interesting fact that this oracle, this utterance, these divine words, this prophecy is found in Proverbs, a book of Proverbs, a, a place you wouldn't expect it. Uh, before moving on, let me just make a few more observations about the text. First, you'll notice that there's several references to man. Uh, he's referred to as the man in verse 1. He refers to himself as more stupid than any man, verse 2, and also says he doesn't have the understanding of a man. In English, it looks like, even though the word's being used in slightly different ways, even in English, it looks like the same word, right? But in Hebrew, it's actually three different words. In verse one, when it says the man, it's actually the word gibor with the definite article, ha geber, right? So uh, if you're aware of, well, think for example of in uh, the books of Samuel, it refers to David's mighty men. The word for mighty men there is gibor. When Isaiah 9, 6 refers to the Messiah as the mighty God, it's El Gibor. 
right? So a word for a man, a mighty man, is gibor. And so this one is referred to as Hagibor, the man. You might even translate it, the mighty man declares to Ithiel. Okay, so uh, David's mighty men uh, it would evoke ideas of, of the men that were associated with David. Uh, but in any case, uh, it's a different word than what you find in verse 2. Uh, there you have the, the word ish, which is a word for referring to uh, men or a husband, right? So, for example, when... Eve in Genesis 3, when it says, your desire shall be for your husband, I think it's better rendered your man, but uh, it's a whole other topic. But it, it's the same. that word is used to refer to man, and in the case of a woman's spouse for her husband, scores of times in Scripture. So it, it specifically designates a male, Okay, so a male human being. Then the third reference is actually the word Adam. So the word for Adam or mankind. So the verse is saying, the mighty man declares to Ithiel, to Ithiel and Ucal, surely I'm more stupid than any man, that is any male, and I don't have the understanding of man, that is mankind, the, 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 the race of Adam. So th this is very interesting because, now I mean, think this through, here's this oracle and it's somewhat prophetic, and this person's then going to be giving us some insight, but he's eschewing knowledge. He's eschewing the kind of knowledge that characterizes men, the race of Adam, human beings as such, and he's identifying himself as a mighty man. Now, there, there's something puzzling then about what happens as you move through the context. Notice that on the one hand, he says, surely I'm more stupid than any man. Uh, I, I just I love every time I read that you know, more stupid than any man. Uh, most of us don't speak so uh, of ourselves. Let this be an encouragement to you, <laughs> but I'm I'm more stupid than any man. I don't I do not have the understanding of a man, neither have I learned wisdom? So this person sounds like he's telling you he is an utter buffoon. He's, he's nobody that you want to look to or listen to. But wait a minute, doesn't that seem strange? That should seem strange because he's just identified these words, his words, okay? The words of this person who's more stupid than any man, doesn't have the understanding of a man, hasn't learned wisdom. This person has told you that his words are oracular. His words are a divine utterance. So something's problematic here. Surely I'm more stupid than any man. I don't have the understanding of a man. Neither have I learned wisdom. Now, if you're just looking at verses 2 and the first part of verse 3, the fourth part of this, the fourth line, that is the last part of verse 3, seems to follow, nor do I have the knowledge of the Holy One. But none of this seems to square well with verse 1, right? It doesn't seem to jive with verse 1. Well, if we actually look at the Hebrew text of that last clause in verse 3, we notice that while the Hebrew text does say, surely I'm more stupid than any man, and does say, I do not have the understanding of, the, of a man, and does say, neither have I learned wisdom, it does not negate the last clause. Okay, What's happening here, I mean, what it really literally says, I mean, there you, you see it in Hebrew, uh, you can see that the, the surely is there, and the not is there in the second clause, and the not is there in the third clause, but it's not the same word in the fourth clause. Okay, it's not negating knowledge of the Holy One. It's contrasting, literally, the knowledge of the Holy One that he has and is now uttering with the understanding of men that he does not have. This one, you might say, in fact, the, the word for stupid is kind of like uh, brutish and so forth, but you might say that this one is eschewing knowledge of, that comes from flesh and blood and is claiming divine insight, right? What this one is proclaiming has not been revealed to him by flesh and blood, but by his Father who's in heaven, right? God who is in heaven. Right? This is the source of Agur's knowledge. 
And this, by the way, already should give us some reason to expect that the sun that this one is talking about can't just be some ordinary sense of sun, right? Uh, in fact, um, uh, oh, well, let me, let me show you, by the way, before I, I get into that, uh, how some other translations have rendered this. I never acquired wisdom, but I know what the Holy One knows. Okay, that's the International Standard Version. The, the LSV says, nor have I learned wisdom, yet I know the knowledge of the Holy Ones. Young's literal translation, yet the knowledge of the Holy Ones I know. The Septuagint, following the Hebrew, says, God has taught me wisdom, and I know the knowledge of the Holy One. Now, you might have noticed that some of the translations, especially the literal translations, render the phrase the Holy One not in the singular, because in Hebrew, it's not singular. It's kedoshim, and it's plural. The yod-mem ending indicates a plural. So it literally means, I have knowledge of the holy ones. But all of this should already be leading us to think that the sun that he's asking about isn't just, you know, it, this isn't something that you could just arrive at in any ordinary way. This is not a matter of, of human wisdom or insight. This is something that goes beyond that. What Agur is declaring here goes beyond human knowledge and, and insight. Okay. Well, now Jews, of course, they, they can't abide what already seems to be the point that the author is pushing at, namely that this is a divine son, right? Just like his father is divine, so this son refers to his divine son. And so what Jewish people will often argue, this isn't the only interpretation, it's just, well, truth be told, being gracious, it's, it's the best they have to go with, okay? Maybe on some other occasion, I'll bring up some of the other lesser uh, interpretations, but this, this is the one that seems to have more going for it, and it's more common to hear Jewish people put forward this idea, uh, namely that the sun in view in Proverbs 30 is Israel, okay? Now, part of the problem I'm going to sh show you verses, of course, where Israel is called God's son. And this, well, let me just mention them first. But here's, here is Exodus 4, and then I also have a bunch of other passages where Israel is either referred to as God's sons, or God is referred to as their father or the one who begat them. And so... Yes, it is true. The Old Testament identifies Israel as God's son. So here you have in Exodus 4, Moses being told by God to tell Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me. Uh, Deuteronomy 14 says, you are the sons of the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 32, 19 says, uh, the Lord, uh, well, in Deuteronomy 32, the Lord refers to them as his sons and daughters. So clearly, uh, it is true that Israel can be referred to in some sense as the Lord's son. Another example, well-known example, would be Hosea 11. In fact, it's quoted by Matthew, albeit in a way that many people find objectionable. I've talked about why it isn't on other occasions, and I'll have some occasion to mention why it isn't wrong the way Matthew uses it here. But uh, again, you have Hosea 11. It's contextually talking about Israel. It says, when Israel was a youth, I loved him. So it's past tense. And out of Egypt, I called my son. So it's referring to the historical event of the Exodus when God called Israel out of Egypt. And Israel is then called his son. So it is true that Israel can be called God's son. Now, it's interesting. I can't help but mention, because I, I mentioned the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 14. I mentioned various texts in Deuteronomy 32. It's interesting that at the end of the Torah, when you have sort of a, uh, you know, it's wrapping things up. It, it's, it's talked about Israel being taken out of Egypt. It's giving you the backstory in Genesis, the 
promises made to the patriarchs, and it shows God fulfilling his promises to them in, in taking their, the people out of Egypt. But then as it ends in the Torah, it ends on this ominous note in Deuteronomy 32, this ominous note foretelling the future when Israel will turn from God and he will reject them. So even though Deuteronomy 32 refers to God as their father and to Israel as his children or his son, notice what Hebrew or Deuteronomy 32 says. The rock, his work is perfect for all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. They have acted corruptly toward him. They're, they are not his children because of their defect, but are a perverse and crooked generation. So the final word in the Torah is that this people that was once called his son is not uh, his son. They are not his children. However, the Torah, I mean, the whole point that the Torah is driving at is that God is going to send his son, and Israel is raised up in, in light of that to be a pointer. Israel has a mission, even though she ultimately fails, because the whole point is she's not the true son. She is but a uh, forecasting of, of the true son. That's why when Jesus comes in the New Testament, he recapitulates or retraces Israel's steps. Right? He, uh, he's, he's baptized in the in the waters right the the, the heavens are parted uh, the spirit descends upon him he goes out into the wilderness uh, he's there for 40 days just like moses was uh, gone from israel for 40 i mean the whole thing is a recapitulation of it israel had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years because of her sinning against the lord during the time when moses went up the mountain and also in sinning uh when the spies went into the land, right? So the 40 days in these two cases are turned into a punishment for 40 years. All right. So Israel, the final word on her is they're not uh, his children. Israel is not his son. So that kind of puts a, uh, a cloud over this idea that the son in Proverbs, which is oracular, is, is Israel. Not to mention the whole fact that this, this text seems to be telling us something weighty, something that goes beyond what uh, others would ordinarily know. All right. Here's something. Well, I don't want to spend too much time here. I could easily do so. In fact, uh, the good news is I did a whole series of, or I did a whole show on this. I don't know if I did a series on it, but I know it's several hours long. On, I think I did Maybe, maybe I did two different shows that in one way or another intersected with this. But one I did was on, it was a response to Tovia Singer called In the Beginning Was the Sun. And in that, I talk a lot about what is stated earlier in the book of Proverbs. Okay, so notice, this is within the book of Proverbs. Within the book of Proverbs, you already have an identification of who this one is. Okay, but if you want, the, I'm going to say a few things here, but if you want a detailed discussion of this, go listen to that uh, lecture on the relationship between Genesis 1, Proverbs 1, and or Proverbs 8, and John 1. The fact of the matter is there's a remarkable number of intertextual connections between these passages. There's no question that Proverbs 8 is intentionally borrowing terms from Genesis 1 and therefore giving you a intertextual way of interpreting Proverbs 1 or Genesis 1. When Genesis 1 speaks about creation, Proverbs 8 is filling in details. In any case, uh, notice that it refers to wisdom here the context is talking about wisdom it says the lord possessed me it uses the hebrew verb kana which is interestingly enough the same word that eve echoes or alludes to when she names cain so when eve acquires or possesses a son her firstborn son she names him cain because it sounds like the word for possess or acquired Right. She even says there, uh, because I have acquired a man. Okay. So, in fact, even the language there is significant. What she literally says is that she's acquired a man child. It's strange language. 
Why would she call him a man child? And the literal Hebrew suggests that Eve thought that the male child that she had conceived was the promised seed spoken of in Genesis 3.15. I have acquired a man, the Lord. That's how the literal Hebrew reads. Obviously, she was mistaken. Cain turns out to be, if anything, a forerunner of Antichrist as he persecutes the true righteous one in that context, which was Abel, who then has to be uh, replaced by Seth, uh, who's raised up in his stead. But anyways, here you have that word being used. And it, so it, it's a word that already has in its original usage back in Genesis 4, this notion of begetting. And it's actually used that way in some passages. It, it's used in passages where the notion of something being um, uh, brought or begotten or something along those lines is is sort of in the air. But even if one doesn't recognize that nuance, the fact is, twice in Proverbs 8, wisdom speaks of being brought forth prior to creation, okay? prior to the works of Christ. So this is an eternal reality. This is an eternal begetting. Okay? This begetting takes place prior to space and time. Okay? This is not something that is part of created reality. Wisdom, of, you know, even if you want to take wisdom here as merely a personification, which I don't hold, even if you want to take wisdom here as a personification, and it's referring then to God's attribute of wisdom, you have to recognize that wisdom is understood as eternal. God's attribute of wisdom is not something that came into being. Okay? So likewise, the language, when it's properly viewed as referring to a person, in keeping with all the language here, when it's properly viewed as referring to a person, you can't then suddenly say, oh, it's referring to someone who came into being later. This is an eternal begetting that's in view here. In fact, uh, when you look at the Masoretic text, the, the, the word that's used for uh, brought forth is used in a number of places to refer to a begetting. Um, in fact, um, it's used that way in Deuteronomy 32.18, it's used that way in Job 15, 7. Uh, in Psalm 51, when, when David says, I was conceived in sin, uh, sin and brought forth in iniquity, it's the same word. So it's, it is a word that, that is used to refer to begetting or birthing or what have you. Okay, But the, the Masoretic text says, I was brought forth. The Septuagint says, before the mountains were seated and before all the hills, he begat me. So it uses the actual Greek term for being begotten. Okay, so that's not just me being fanciful. In fact, the Targum on Proverbs, so the Aramaic, says before the mountains took shape and before the hills, I was begotten. Okay, so when you have a text that is so full of intertextual connections with Genesis 1 and is then ex explaining or interpreting what's happening in Genesis 1, uh, and then it refers to this one who is with God, creating all things with him as begotten. It's clearly talking about his son. In, in fact, um, well, I won't read the, the rest of, of Proverbs 8, but it, it talks about this one being at his side, delighting in his presence and being a master craftsman. Uh, but, but here's some of the intertextual connections. Both passages use the word for beginning, right? In the beginning. Uh, it says in Genesis, but a sheath, but ah, in the beginning, God created. Uh, Proverbs 8 says, from the beginning, the Lord possessed me. So he, you're already being told in Proverbs, this one was there, right? Pro, uh, Proverbs 8 also refers to heaven and earth. These are the things that God is creating in Genesis 1. They're also in view in, in Proverbs 8 is that which the Lord is, is uh, bringing forth. Uh, it mentions the face of the deep in both texts. The Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the deep. Well, wisdom was there when God uh, drew a circle on the face of the deep. Uh, in other words, he's making the boundaries and so forth. On and on, the text goes with these intertextual connections. Uh, I mean, this is like intertextual gold. Anybody who recognizes the fact or phenomena of intertextuality in Scripture and that this is a way that Scripture uh, alludes back to other passages and inter interprets other passages, can't turn to this text and suddenly say, oh, that's you know not relevant. These are two dis disparate texts, two very different, unrelated texts. 
Uh, this is the cream of the crop when it comes to intertextuality. Uh, and by the way, this is how Jews understood all of this. This isn't just, and I know I always tell you this because I've heard this stuff a thousand times. You know, this is anachronistic, right? This is Christians reading their theology into the Bible. Well, here's Targum Yafidi. I've showed you this before. This is chapter one. Notice what it says here in Targum Yafidi. In fact, uh, I'll make it bigger for you. It says, from the beginning, with wisdom, the memra of the Lord created and perfected the heavens and the earth. Now, there's all kinds of things going on here, but briefly, you, some of the targums are, are terser. They're, they're shorter, but they're, they're making the same point. Some just say, from the beginning, with wisdom. But notice, there's there's two ways, or from the beginning with wisdom, the Lord created, okay, so, or God created. Or or some will say, well, I'll just stick with that. Some say from the beginning with wisdom. Here, here it echoes Proverbs in two ways. One, it's talking about wisdom. Proverbs says God created with wisdom. So does Psalm 33, 6, by the way, or uh, passages in Jeremiah, or it talks about his word as the way God made things. But, um, even the phrase from the beginning okay, is an echo of Proverbs because Proverbs words it slightly differently, right? Uh, in Genesis, it's barashith, in the beginning. In Proverbs, it's from the beginning because it's talking about the Lord possessing wisdom there. Here, it's uh, in Genesis, it's, it's speaking of the creation itself as that which God is making. And so there's this slight variation, but it shows you already that Proverbs is viewed as, as relevant to Genesis 1. And so when it says from the beginning, you already should be thinking of Proverbs. In fact, if I recall, Proverbs is the only other place in the Bible, in the Old Testament, where it uses the phrase from the beginning, that exact expression. I'm pretty sure that's true. But in any case, both are talking about the creation of the world. So you know that the language connection and the uh, substance, right, the content of it connection uh, shows you that that's what the Targumim have in view when they render the passage this way. They're interpreting Genesis 1 intertextually. So when it also goes on to say with wisdom, that pushes it, you know, it's clear. This is talking about Proverbs 8. But then on top of that, it says the memra or the word of the Lord throughout the Targums, God's memra is his wisdom. His wisdom is his memra, right? So, it's just expanding this notion that it's the wisdom of God that created everything, or the memra. Uh, or either the memra simply called wisdom, or the memra as the one in whom are found all the treasures. Well, I'm borrowing from the New Testament, right? In him are deposited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Paul says. Uh, Christ is the very wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Right, so, again, this is what the Targum say. But now notice this. Not only do the Targums sometimes say from the beginning with wisdom, the memory of the Lord created, but there's also variant readings of this in, in different manuscripts. So notice the little B there. That's a reference to a footnote down here. And here's what the footnote says. In wisdom, the son of the Lord perfected heaven and earth. Okay, so that's what the variant reads of the Targum. Okay, so... The first point that I'm making here is that this very interesting text in Proverbs 30, where you have this oracle, this prophetic utterance found in an unexpected place in a book of Proverbs, a very different genre, where the person is eschewing ordinary knowledge and claiming divine insight. It, that same book identifies God's wisdom or his word as his son, as that which was begotten of him and was with him at the creation of all things. Okay? This, according to Proverbs, is the wisdom who is with God. This is the one then whom Agur, if we're interpreting the book in light of its own teachings, this is the one that Agur has in view when he puts forth his utterance. But there's also something else that's very interesting. Actually, there's 10 other things, and we're going to get to them, but uh, I don't know if it's actually 10, but there's a lot of other things that we're going to get to. 
I mentioned before that there's not one but two oracles in the book of Proverbs. They both occur at the end of the book. So you have 29 chapters of Proverbs, 29 chapters of Proverbs from Solomon, right? The son of David, by the way. Isn't it interesting? The, the son of David is that man in the Old Testament that we especially think of when we think of wisdom. Son of David and wisdom. So David gave birth to that man who, above all others, was characterized by wisdom. You're supposed to be seeing, I mean, just, just the, this very fact is, is setting you up to how you ought to think about the Messiah, right? The Messiah is the son of David par excellence. He is the wisdom of God par excellence, right? That's, that's what you're supposed to see when you think of David and Solomon, this relationship, and David being the, the man to whom uh, God gave wisdom beyond that of anyone else. In any case, here you... Uh, at the end of this book of Proverbs, you suddenly have these oracles from two men. Uh, I don't know why it says the words of Jackhead, the oracle. I think I, I wrote that wrong. It should say, you know what the text says, right? The words of Agur, the son of Jackhead, the oracle. So I wrote it wrong. But uh, in both cases, notice these are called oracles, right? So the words of Agur are referred to as the oracle, and so are the words of King Lemuel. Well, what is Proverbs 31 all about? You all know what Proverbs 31 is about. You also wouldn't think that Proverbs 31, just by reading it, is an oracle, but it is. Most people read Proverbs as though it's describing the ideal woman, and I, I'm not saying that we can't use it in this way, but we should first understand the intention of the author and then, in light of that, make our application, right? So many times what people want to do is they want to go to the Bible and ask how it directly and immediately applies to them. But the first thing you need to be asking is, what is this author doing? And, and what the authors of Scripture are doing primarily in the first place is driving you to Christ. Okay, Jesus wasn't being hyperbolic when he said that Moses wrote about me. The Torah is about me. He's not saying the Torah has a couple of prophecies about me, right? He's not saying, oh yeah, you can find references to me in Deuteronomy 18 and Deuteronomy 34, right? That's not what Jesus is doing. He's saying the Torah is about me. When Jesus said to the disciples on the road to Emmaus that all things that are written about me in the law of Moses and in the Psalms and in the prophets had to be fulfilled, he's, he's not identifying those books as books that have tucked away in some little corner uh, incidental occasional references to him. He's characterizing these books as essentially messianic books. These are books about him. Okay? Our first goal in reading scripture should be to understand what the authors are doing, and we should recognize that what they're doing is leading us to Christ. Proverbs 31 is talking about a virtuous woman, but it, it, it it's asking a question and, and telling us about her. It's telling you about this woman, and you're supposed to be asking, who is she, right? Who is this woman? Well, here's something interesting. I just read to you a few of the things that Proverbs says about this woman. It uh, looks like part of that's cut off for me. I don't know if it's cut off for you, but it says uh, it's verses 10, 20, 23, and 31. But this woman is called a wife of noble character. So some translations will uh, translate it as a, a wife of uh, an excellent wife, right? Or a, a wife of great virtue or something along those lines. So a, she's called a wife of noble character who can find. For her worth is far above rubies or jewels. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. Her husband is respected at the town gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works be, uh, bring her praise at the city gate. Okay, now um, I'm going to uh, stop here for just a second. Because I, I'm just curious, I want to see in the chat, having read that, can any of you think of who this woman 
might be, or maybe just ask it this way. Can you think of a woman that answers to this in some way that, that a woman who fits the bill, right? A woman that, uh, is characterized by these things, a woman of virtue, an excellent woman, uh, now, okay. Now, I should say, it, it, I should put it this way. See, now, because you all you all put these good answers, and I, I can't fault you for that, right? Too many Marys says the church. Darling, you says Israel. I can't fault you guys for giving good answers like that. But maybe I should put it this way. Can you think of a woman that Scripture actually calls an excellent woman or a, a, a wife of noble character? A, a woman of virtue. Uh, where is that language actually used for someone in Scripture? There's actually only one person that this language is used for. And, and what I'm pushing you towards, and, and maybe this will help a little bit, this will help a little bit, I'm, I'm pushing for you to see that these two oracles at the end of the book, all right, we got an answer. <laughs> Ruth. Ruth. Whoops. Ruth. Um, the book of Proverbs at its end is leading you to think about the Son of God, right? What is his name and the name of his Son? And also to think in terms of the promise made to David, namely that he would be given a seed that would be who would David's seed be? David is promised, we're going to look at the text in a moment, David is promised that his son, his seed, the Messiah, would also be God's son, right? So at the end of the book of Proverbs, what I'm getting at is this same book that identifies this figure as the son of the Lord, the very wisdom of God, also leads you to start thinking about David and therefore of the promise that was made to David. And it does that in Proverbs 31 and in other ways. We're going to see other ways, but it does that at the end by bringing up a woman of noble character. But notice what it says about Ruth. It refers to Ruth at the uh, in um, chapter 4. As or well, so notice it says at the beginning, a wife of noble character who can find, and then at the end it says, uh, let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Well, here at the end, uh, it says, I will do for you whatever you ask for all the people at the city gate know that you are a woman of noble character. Okay, it's the same language. She's the only woman specifically who's called a woman of noble character. Okay, so when you have this oracle prophetic word at the end of the book talking about a woman of noble character and then the book of Ruth coming along and referring to her the grandmother of David who then will ultimately be the mother of the Messiah it's evident that the author of Proverbs and of Ruth they're trying to get you to think uh, well the, the Ruth the author of Ruth is pointing you back to this and the author of Proverbs is, is pointing you forward to Ruth or vice versa, whatever order of composition you want to think of here. Um, but it's not just that. Notice Proverbs 31 says, she opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. Well, that's exactly what Ruth does, according to Ruth 2. Remember that Naomi had gone to a Gentile territory where they weren't supposed to go because there was a famine in Israel, and her husband and sons die there, and Ruth was the wife of one of the sons, and Ruth determines to go with Naomi back to uh, Israel, and Naomi goes, she's, she's poor, she's impoverished, she has nothing, but Ruth determines to go with her, even though she could have stayed with her own people and fared just fine, but instead she chooses to go, chooses to go with Naomi, she goes out and, and works, she's productive with her hands, and she brings back uh, provisions for uh, Naomi. And uh, so you see that in, in uh, Ruth 2, where it says, 
So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. She took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also took it out and gave Naomi what she had left after she was satisfied. So here is a woman who is working with her hands and providing for Naomi, who is poor. All right. We also read that Boaz went up to the town gate. Uh, he took 10 men of the elders of the city. The same thing stated about uh, the, the husband of the virtuous woman in the book of Proverbs. Uh, he's respected at the town gate and among the elders. So who is this Ruth? Of course, you know who she is. At the end of Ruth 4, you're, you're given a genealogy. And really, you're given this genealogy to tell you what the whole book is about. You're not just being told this little love story, right? That's The book of Ruth is not about this nice story of how an Israelite man met a non-Israelite woman and, uh, you know, married her. It's giving you the story about David. It's giving you the, the, the links in the chain. This is where David comes from. Okay. So, uh, in fact, um, notice it says, so they named him Obed, that is the son of Ruth and Boaz. They named him Obed. He's the father of Jesse, the father of David. And it repeats it again. The last verse of Ruth says, and to Obed was born Jesse and to Jesse, David. Uh, interestingly, there are four names in common here that are also mentioned in the genealogy in Matthew. Matthew doesn't include every name, but every name that he mentions from this list, he also mentions the woman that was associated with this person in one way or another. So uh, Matthew will mention Tamar, right? So Tamar and Judah had Perez. And then he mentions Salmon, Salmon and uh, Rahab, or, or Rahab, excuse me, Salmon and Rahab uh, had Boaz, and uh, Boaz and Ruth, right? Rahab and uh, Ruth are also mentioned in Matthew, and then David is mentioned in connection with Bathsheba. So just an interesting little fact, but it's it's evident why we're being given this. We're being given this because it's telling us about David, and David, of course, is going to be the father of the Messiah. It's going to be to David that God will promise that he will raise up for him a son. All right, now, uh, oh, before I move on, here is Targum Ruth. I just want you to see that Jewish sources were thinking in messianic uh, ways when they read the book of Ruth. They, they weren't just, you know, like contemporary Jews trying to read the Messiah out of places. They were seeing the Messiah where he is, right? So they weren't, they weren't trying to uh, obfuscate or ignore pertinent facts. Uh, sometimes it might look like a stretch to us how they arrived at certain things. And sometimes that may be the case, but I've learned that a lot of times what may initially appear somewhat like a stretch sometimes has a very interesting rationale behind it. Now, I'm not going to go into what appears to be the rationale here, but notice that it says that uh, he said, bring the scarf that you were wearing and hold it. It's Bo Boaz talking to Ruth. She held it, and he measured out six seahs of barley and put them on it. Strength and power were given to her from before the Lord to carry them. And immediately it was said to her prophetically that there would descend from her six of the most righteous men of all time. Now, whether you understand what justification they have for inserting this here in the Targum, it is a fact that six of the most righteous men of all time descended from Ruth, right? Namely, David, Daniel and his companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the King Messiah, right? So there you have six. I counted with four fingers, but um, six, right? So that's what the Targum says. There are other references to the Messiah in the book of Ruth, but I won't go over them right now. All right. Now, all this is really a setup. It's a setup for what is to come. But I'm going to take a brief break from the slides here and try and catch up with you all in the chat. Plus, I need a drink. I need a drink. I need a break. And thank you so much, all of you, for the super chats. I do see that 
a couple came through that I missed. Let's see. I see there's a new member. Hey, good to see you, Seth Bearden. I think you've been a member before, but good to see you uh, back. Or if, if you are new, I mean, I've seen your name, of course. But thank you. Thank you so much. And there was another one here somewhere. All right. Dylan says, where does the belief that God cannot enter his creation come from? And is it biblical? Not the Mus Muslim version, but I've heard either reformed or Orthodox Jews, I assume you mean, say something similar. How does this relate to Colossians 2.9? Okay. Now I'm assuming you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. I'm assuming that when you say reformed or Orthodox, you mean reformed Judaism or Orthodox Judaism for those that don't know, those are two sects of Judaism. Uh, reformed Jews are a more liberal version of Judaism. You have reformed, you have traditional, and then you have orthodox. Um, I, I assume that's what you're saying because it doesn't make sense if you're asking about reformed in, in the sense of reformed Christians or orthodox uh, apostate right? It's the the group that uh, now worships idols and all of that um so th the idea is essentially post-christian it's not even proper to say talmudic if if you read the talmud god is entering creation all over the place in the talmud uh, there's no question from the perspective of the talmud that that god can enter into his creation however a lot of Jews filter the Talmud now through, it's, it's not just that the Bible's filtered through the, the Talmud for Jews, it's that the Talmud is filtered through men like Rashi and especially in its philosophical uh, ideas, it's filtered through Mahmanides. So Mahmanides was influenced by Muslims. Mahmanides lived under islamic rule and had to walk around on eggshells to some degree and in any case was influenced by muslims especially the philosophical side of islam so in islam you have different groups the more philosophically inclined muslims tend to think of god as transcendent and not also imminent and this is because, in their minds, if God is imminent, then it, it seems to limit him and make him composite. I mean, there's just all kinds of issues philosophically that in their mind would arise and pose problems for their understanding of God as transcendent and existing prior to the world and all of that. Now, I, of course, don't agree with any of that. I don't buy any of that. Um, I do agree that God is transcendent, but I don't think his transcendence inhibits his imminence. In fact, I think it's precisely because he's transcendent in the way that he is, that he's able to be present with everything, upholding it all at, at the same time. Uh, his presence in and with all things is not to be viewed in a localized sense, as if you know, God's big toe is over there and his, you know, pinky toe is in China, you know, uh, God's not spread out. He's not a material being. He doesn't have extension in space. So when we speak of God being present, it's in an ineffable way. He's, he's present in a way that is true to the nature of his existence, which as creatures is not something we can penetrate, but, uh, in other words, it doesn't involve God being circumscribed. And that's the very point that Solomon's making in his dedicatory prayer in 1 Kings 8, when he says, will God dwell in this temple? You know, he, he, he knows that, that this temple can't house God. That's what leads Solomon to query about this. Will he really dwell here? He says, the heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. Paul in Acts 17 says God doesn't dwell, meaning he's not confined by temples made with human hands. And so, the Bible maintains God's transcendence, but doesn't maintain it in a way that precludes his imminence, his ability to be present with everything or to manifest himself in special ways at times that he deems fit. So the idea doesn't come from the Bible. 
the idea comes from pagan philosophy. Ironic, isn't it, that the group that pretends we get our doctrines from paganism actually gets their rejection of Christianity from pagan notions. And now, no doubt, these same groups, whether we're talking about Orthodox Jews or Muslims, will try to go to the Bible to justify their beliefs. But, you know, that's a fool's errand. You know, I, I love the discussion between any Muslim and any Jew over whether or not God can enter into creation or reveal himself in creation. Uh, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're going to be like an exegetical cat on hot textual bricks trying to argue that God is not able to appear in his creation. All right. And Dominic says, I didn't see a Starbucks, so I'm glad for that. Here's another espresso on me. Well, truth be told, truth be told, I had my espresso before this because I was finishing up some of these slides. Uh, but Dominic says, does the phrase in the Targums from before the Lord refer to the Holy Spirit? Well, it could, it could on occasion, but it's, it's usually a way of, it's like an idiomatic way of, of, uh, referring to something uh, for, I'm trying to think of a text as an example, but, um, when it says that, uh, in Genesis one, uh, or Genesis 19, when it says that the Lord rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven, it'll say from before the Lord out of heaven or something like that. Uh, it, it adds that statement and it does it a lot. you know. So I wouldn't say it, there's never an occasion where it could specifically have reference to the spirit, but it ends up looking peculiar in certain passages because it's it's it almost accentuates in some places, a distinction that's already apparent elsewhere, right? So Genesis 19, 24 is a perfect example. If, if it already says in the Hebrew text, the Lord reigned from the Lord, that already points up two persons, especially since in the Hebrew text, it has the direct object marker prior to the second occurrence of the divine name. By the way, you know, something funny here. Um, I, I was talking about this not too long ago on one of my shows and I, I made mention of how some people try to explain this sort of thing away as ilyism, which is when one person refers to himself in the third person, which can sometimes happen. You can't just arbitrarily say any reference in the third person is the same person talking about himself just because this is a, way of speaking sometimes, but it is true that sometimes a person can refer to himself in the third person. Well, I was arguing against the idea that it's a example of Iliism in Exodus 24, when the Lord says, come up the mountain to the Lord. I think it's a actual reference to another person because contextually the angel of the Lord is identified as a bearer of the divine name. So when the Lord says, come up to the Lord, he's talking about the angel of the Lord, the Malach Yahweh. And there are other reasons for thinking that as well. But uh, I was refuting this whole notion. And Carlos Xavier leaves me this message. So he's the son-in-law of Anthony Buzzard, a, a Unitarian. Uh, they're contemporary Socinians. There's about, uh, it's kind of an aside, but uh, it reminds me of Dale Tuggy one time. One time, Dale, I know I'm telling you now a second or third diversion here, but uh, I'll try and remember everything I'm talking about and, and wrap each one of these up. But Dale Tuggy told me one time, oh, when I debated him, he told me that my view was a fringe view. Now, I, I found this entirely laughable because all the churches in his denomination number a, a sum total of like 25, right? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Your entire denomination your entire cult consists of 25 churches, probably five people each at max, right? Maximum capacity, five people. Uh, and you're telling me my view is a fringe view. Plus, 
you don't have the scholarship you pretend to have. You can't possibly know what you're uh, saying is true because you haven't done the homework. And I knew that because I had done the homework, right? It, it was so laughable. But anyways, so Carlos Xavier says, uh, we have refuted your claim that this is an example of ilyism. And I'm thinking, Carlos, you knucklehead, Carlos, how could you be refuting my claim that this is an example of ilyism when my whole point is that it's not ilyism? You need it to be ilyism. So he shows in the very process he didn't understand me. And number two, he doesn't understand his own position well enough. Ilyism is what he has to be arguing is going on in these passages. Now, note, by the way, that while I think contextually it doesn't work in Exodus 24, 1, in Genesis 19, 24, it's impossible to explain it as an example of Ilyism. Because Genesis 19, 24 is not an example of God speaking about himself or anyone else in the third person. It's not God speaking in Genesis 19:24. It's Moses, the narrator, explaining what happened. Moses said, the Lord rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. You can't say this is the Lord speaking about himself in the third person because it's not the Lord speaking. It's Moses writing and explaining what happened. And he uses, moreover, the direct object marker that distinguishes one person from another. One person reigned from the other. So that's, Carlos, if you're listening, what you need to deal with. That's what you actually have to address. Um. Yeah, so uh, I went off on those little tangents. I think I think I addressed your question, right? So yeah, the, the phrase from before the Lord does often accentuate uh, a distinction, but you don't need it in the Hebrew text, but it does accentuate it. And sometimes you find it in places where the Hebrew text doesn't do that. So you get some people claiming that what the, what the, Targumim are doing is they're trying to avoid anthropomorphisms, right? An anthropomorphism is a way of speaking about God using terms derived from human experience or ascribing to God human characteristics. Okay? We recognize that God in his essential nature is the creator of heaven and earth, right? So all space, matter, time, he's, he transcends those. He's not subject to them or confined or constrained by them. He's not circumscribed by any of that. So he can't have literal anatomical features or any of those sorts of things. But scripture nevertheless does when speaking about him, sometimes use figures derived from human uh, anatomy, right? It talks about the heavens being created uh, by his hands, you know, his handiwork. And so some people will say that what the Targums are doing is trying to avoid anthropomorphisms, but they're just not because you can find anthropomorphisms in the Targums. And so a statement like from before the Lord, it, it's not avoiding some other way of, you know, like what, they, what, what they're saying is those who argue that this is an anthropomorphism is they don't want to say this was from the Lord. They want to say from before the Lord, because in their mind, it, it gets too close, you know, to this, you know, putting associating God with this activity directly. Right. They don't want to make God directly involved. So they say from before the Lord. Right. That supposedly distances him from his direct involvement, which could be understood anthropomorphically. But you, you just can't say that about all these texts when you've got numerous texts in the Targums that do use figures of speech for God this way, just like the Hebrew text. Uh, besides that, you don't end up accomplishing, in many cases, what you think you would be accomplishing by the language of the Targums, because sometimes the Targum language actually ends up going beyond uh, what their supposedly anti-anthropomorphic uh, agenda, you know, what... what it seems to be going in the opposite direction sometimes. What I mean is this. In order to deal with the Memra passages of the Targums, when it speaks about the word of the Lord doing things, you get people that will say, it doesn't want to ascribe this activity to God directly, so it ascribes it to the Memra of God, the word of the Lord. Now, the, the problem is that... 
if the Targums are not really identifying a second person as the one by whom and with whom the Lord did this, but are just doing this to avoid uh, speaking about God in human ways or making him directly involved with things, notice that they end up shooting themselves in the foot because now on top of not avoiding, I mean, you either have this problem that, well, if, if the word of the Lord is just a way of referring to the, to, to the Lord himself without saying it, then e either, you know, you still have to ask the question, well, then who did the creating, the, the forming, the fashioning? I, if the member of the Lord is not just another way of referring to the Lord, in which case it's still the Lord doing all of this, that, you know, you're supposedly getting away from by adding this targamic or this memra language. Or this is actually a second person, but that seems to go opposite of the supposedly Unitarian position of Jews, right? So it's it's like you've you've got the the Targums just uh, uh, ending up being a confused mishmash. It, it just doesn't work. Uh, but anyways, um, hopefully that helps. Although I stated that roughly, I mean, the basic idea is either direction you go with that ends up being a problem for uh, for Jews. All right. Who's ready to get back into this? Let me summarize what we've seen so far. So far, we've seen that the book of Proverbs, curiously, has a couple of oracles toward the end, an oracle of Agur and an oracle of Lemuel. And in the first oracle, referring to the Lord's son, we're given the idea that this son is one who's known by divine revelation and not through ordinary means. And for that reason, it makes it difficult to think that this could possibly just be uh, understood as a reference to Israel. Now, when we look intertextually, when we look at the book of Proverbs itself, we find that the wisdom of God in Proverbs 8 is, in fact, identified in ways very similar to Pro uh, Proverbs 30 as with God and active with him in the act of creating heaven, earth, the winds, the waters, and so forth, right? Remember who can who gathered up the winds in his fist, and you know, that kind of language is found in Proverbs 8, and it's ascribed to wisdom. And Proverbs 8, moreover, is echoing Genesis 1, where God creates all things by his word and spirit and even says, let us make man in our image, right? So you already have in Genesis this idea of a plurality of personal subjects who create, namely God's word and spirit. In the language of Genesis 1, you've got ways of understanding that that, that would evoke in the mind of a Hebrew reader God's word or his son or his wisdom because, well, it, I don't want to get into all that. It'll take too long. You have to go watch that series where I talked about in the beginning was the sun. But I've already shown you this episode, a, a Targum, where the Jews did that. In the beginning with wisdom, the memra of the Lord or the son of the Lord created the heavens and the earth. So all of this we have going on uh, in the book of Proverbs. We also saw a link with David because the second oracle that immediately follows it points us to Ruth, who's the father of or excuse me, Ruth, who marries Boaz, and they are the, the parents of Obed and eventually uh, Jesse and then and David, who is the father of Solomon on down to the Messiah. So you're already being led to think in terms of uh, a divine son and also the son of David. So... Let me. I want to show you a text. I've I've dealt with this before, to some degree, but it's going to be very important here, for more than one reason. But here is oh, we already looked at these. That's Proverbs eight. All right. Pardon me, pardon me. All right, here we are. Numbers 23 and 24. I want you to notice what happens in 
a series of oracles of Balaam. Okay? A series of oracles. The, the context of this, so th this is chapter 23 that I'm reading, but I want to tell you quickly about the context and uh, at least catch you up if you are rusty on, on this. But back in Numbers 22, we're told that Israel is in the plains of Moab. So they've already been in two battles with two different groups on their trek through the wilderness. And so the, the Moabites, Midianites and so forth, are uh, upset about Israel being so close. And so uh, the king, Balak, wants to come against them and chase them off, but he, he's, he's afraid of them because they're so numerous. And they just kicked the hides of, of two other groups. And so what he wants to do is he wants to enlist Balaam, who's a kind of, uh, well, he's a, a diviner. Uh, he, he's, he's not an Israelite prophet. Uh, he's, he's a man for hire. He's given to spells and omens. He, he curses people. And so Balak wants to enlist him to curse Israel and therefore make his job easier in chasing off Israel. And so the Lord tells Balaam, uh, when, when the men come to him, tells him not to go with them, to, to dismiss them and, and be done with it. You, you know, you can't curse them. And so the men come to Balaam and he sends them away. But then the, the king, Balak, sends back an, an additional number of people. Now, this is actually important. I, I should have put Genesis, or Numbers 22 on here because there's something very interesting. In, in Numbers 22, we're told that the king adds to their number. Okay, and he sends them back. Why does he send them back? Because he's trying to get Balaam to do something different than what he had done at the Lord's command and, you know, uh, do something different than what the Lord had said to him before, right? He wants him, in, in effect, to, to add words to those words that he had spoken previously. Those words saying he wouldn't curse Israel because he couldn't. The idea, you're supposed to pick up on this language that, that the king has added to the number of people because later in the text, Balaam's going to say repeatedly that he can't add, right? He can't add to what the Lord had told him to say. Now, now why is this significant? Okay, if you remember when I read Proverbs 30, you remember how the oracle ends? The oracle ends by saying, do not add to his words lest he reprove you and you be found a liar, right? God's word is tested and tried. You know, you can't add to the Lord's words. And so that's the that's what's going on. And that's why Balaam ends up getting in trouble, because even though he's responding correctly in, in one sense, it, it's still like he's he's trying to play both sides. He, he, he continues to sort of entertain these men. And that's when uh, the Lord uh, you know, when, remember when Balaam's traveling and we're told that the angel of the Lord stood in his way and then Balaam's donkey, uh, you know, uh, presses him up against a wall. Like several times the, the donkey uh, does something to uh, slow him down or, or impede his progress. And then Balaam whips him or, or hits him. And so the reason the, the donkey is spooked is because he sees the angel of the Lord and uh, so anyways, you're, you're, the, the point you're supposed to see is that Balaam is being reproved by the Lord because of this whole issue of Balak, who wants him to add to what the Lord had told him. He wants him to say something other than, contrary than, different than, beyond what he had told him already. This is a lesson to us, right? We are not to go beyond what God has revealed, right? We are not to follow the way of Rome or the way of the East, a way that was all too common even among Israel. Okay? That's the way of Balaam. That's what will later be picked up on in the New Testament, where it talks about people going the way of Balaam, a way of, uh, in fact, uh, one of the things that's said, Peter refers to him as, uh, in, a, uh, in effect, a, a, a man who uh, was, was full of greed. Uh, by the way, uh, 
not only does Proverbs 30 say not to add to God's word, do you remember the prayer? Do you remember the prayer in Proverbs 30 that Agur said he prayed to God? So here you have Agur in his, uh, as it were, his dying words. He's about to uh, come to his end. He's worn out. He's, he's about to uh, expire, and he's giving this oracle. And then he tells us about this prayer that he had prayed for himself. He said, I pray to the Lord that he would ne give me neither poverty nor riches, lest I become rich and forget him or, or become poor and profane his name by stealing and so forth. So what he's claiming is to be free from greed, the very thing that characterized Balaam. Right. So you already have just if, if you only knew that you'd already have this reason to think maybe there's something going on in this oracle being given to Balaam. OK, so here's here's numbers 23. It's picking up the story. Balak has uh, gotten Balaam to go uh, to him. Uh, the Lord eventually tells him after rebuke, rebuking him, OK, go ahead, go and and uh, and only speak what I tell you to speak. So Numbers 23 says, Then Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars uh, for me here, and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me there. There, Balak did just as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered up a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Balaam said to Balak, Stand beside your burnt offering, and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me, and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. So notice, he's already doing what was problematic, which was expecting the Lord to add to his word. The, the word to Balaam was, you cannot curse Israel. Israel will not be cursed. You have nothing to do with these men. So here's Balaam uh, still holding out some uh, expectation that the Lord might uh, give him a word that allows him to get paid by Balak, because Balak offered him all sorts of uh, compensation for cursing Israel. So he went to a bare hill, verse 4. Now God met Balaam, and he said to him, I have set up seven, the seven altars, and I have offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and you shall speak thus. So you're to speak the word I've put in your mouth. So he returned to him, and behold, he was standing beside his burnt offering, he and all the leaders of Moab. He took up his discourse and said, Now note carefully his discourse. It says, from Aram, Balak has brought me, Moab's king from, king from the mountains of the east. Come curse Jacob for me and come denounce Israel. Okay, now notice, Jacob and Israel here clearly is a way of referring to the nation. Okay, it's not referring to their ancestor Jacob. It's referring to the nation as Jacob and Israel. Okay, so it's a corporate entity that's in view. So this is the first oracle of four oracles. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? Now, this whole language of cursing or blessing already evokes the Abrahamic promise. Remember, God says, I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Ultimately, what we're going to see is that this promise not to curse, but to bless, and to bless and not to curse, is one that belongs to Israel or really anyone who uh, is properly uh, a, of the seed of Abraham after, you know, not after the flesh, but uh, by faith, right? Now, these are obviously is or Abraham's biological children, but this whole language uh, evokes the Abrahamic promise. But we're going to see eventually that this is ultimately something that belongs to people through faith in Christ. But, but notice how, it, it, for now, that it's it's the corporate entity that's in view here. Balaam says, I see him from the top of the rocks, and I look at him from the hills. Again, it's talking about Israel, a nation, as a corporate entity. Okay? Jacob or Israel is the one in view here when it says, I see him from the top of the rocks, and I look at him from the hills. It's evident that this is referring to the people of Israel, because look at the next verse. Behold, a people who dwells apart and will not be reckoned among the nations. So it's talking about the nation. It switches from the singular to the plural. It's talking 
about the nation of Israel, and it's talking about the nation as that which is present to his gaze, right? The last verse says, I see him from the top of the rocks. I look at him from the hills. The hills. So Israel, the nation, the people are in his view. They are in his gaze. They are near, right? He sees this people. Then he goes on. Who can, oops, who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright. Let my end be like his. So clearly Balaam speaking the word that God put in his mouth has not cursed Israel, but rather has blessed him. This leads Balak to complain. What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, but behold, you have actually blessed them. He replied, must I not be careful to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? Then Balak said to him, please come with me to another place from where you may see them, although you will only see the extreme end of them and will not see all of them and curse them for me from there. So he took him to the field of Zophim, to the top of Pisgah and built seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. And he said to Balak, stand here beside your burnt offering while I myself meet the Lord over there. Then the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Return to Balak, and thus you shall speak. He came to him, and behold, he was standing beside his burnt offering. Then Balak, oops, uh, oops, I went back. What I'm supposed to be showing you here, what I wasn't at the time, is that all of this is indicating, <laughs> um, I forgot I had these slides like this, but all of this, again, is indicating that it's talking about the people, okay, all of them, okay, the people of Israel whom he sees, okay. Uh, Balak said to him, what has the Lord spoken? Then he took up his discourse and said, arise, O Balak, and hear. Give ear to me, O son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Again, the point here is, God has said it. You want him to add to his words as though he's a man, as though he'll go back on his words or add to it and uh, you know, contradict himself or lie. But God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Behold, I have received a command to bless. When he is blessed, then I cannot revoke it. He has not observed misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord his God is with him. The shout of a king is among them. So God is among them as their king. He is their source of blessing, ultimately. And then notice this, especially. Verse 22. So this is the second oracle of Balaam. God brings them out of Egypt. He is for them like the horns of the wild ox. Okay? God brings them out of Egypt. He is for them like the horns of the wild ox. For there is no omen against Jacob, nor is there any divination against Israel. At the proper time it shall be said to Jacob and to Israel what God has done. Behold, a people rises like a lioness, and as a lion it lifts itself. It will not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Now, here's my question to you all. Here's my question. When the text says God brings them out of Egypt, what verse does that sound like to you? God brings them out of Egypt. Well, first I can ask this. Who is it that God is bringing out of Egypt? According to Exodus 4, it's his son. Right? Israel is God's son, his firstborn, right? So God has brought this people, whom he calls his son, out of Egypt. What would that make you think of? I'll, I can tell you what it makes me think of. I, I want to give you... Uh, oh, hey, Slam RN says only three more likes to get 100. Thank you, Slam. Yeah, three more likes, folks, to get 100. What's wrong with all of you... <laughs> All right, Royer says Christ, I agree with you. But I, I'm thinking of a Old Testament text here. What text would you think of that speaks about God's son, Israel, being brought out of Egypt? 
what text might you think of? There might be many, but there's one text that especially comes to mind for me. One text that especially comes to mind. I'll, I'll tell you what text comes to mind. The text that comes to mind, there it is. Dominic said it. Okay. Now, so often, see, it's hard to ask a question that doesn't absolutely give away the answer. That's why some of you give or answers that I can't argue with, right? They're, they're good answers. It's just uh, I'm looking for something specific, but trying not to be too obvious and give it away. So I'm sure you all agree with Dominic, Hosea 11.1, 1, right? Out of Egypt, I called my son. So Israel is God's son. He brought them out of Egypt, right? That's what these two oracles are all about. God delivered them from Egypt. Uh, he is the, the object of, of God's blessings. This, this is what God has done. This is why they cannot be cursed. Now, you might remember that later, Balaam actually succeeds for Balak in a different way. Because, because Balak can't get Balaam to curse Israel, and Balaam can't do it against what the Lord has spoken, Balaam gives Balak the advice of getting the Israelites to sin against God by having relations with foreign women, intermarrying with them, something that God prohibits throughout the Torah and the Tanakh, the entirety of the Old Testament and the New. But throughout Scripture, God forbids this, the intermingling of his people with the pagans. It's not per se ethnic, it's religious. The line drawn is religious, not ethnic. It might say on occasion an Israelite is not supposed to marry a non-Israelite, but the idea is, generally speaking, those who are not Israelites are not in covenant with God. Otherwise, it's okay to marry a non-Israelite as long as they're in covenant with God and so part of the commonwealth of Israel. That's why Ruth was able to marry because she is in effect converting to the religion of the Lord. She worshiped Yahweh. She makes that clear. In fact, she's the quintessential example of Gentile conversion. I mean, there's numerous Gentiles who convert in the Old Testament, but Ruth uh, is is like the quintessential example. So is Rahab. She stands out. But but Ruth just has these great words where she talks about your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. She's essentially speaking the language of the covenant. You know, she is covenanting with God to be her God. And so, uh, but Balaam gets Balak to get the women of Midian to entice Israelite men so that they would sin against God, which would then get God to punish Israel. So there's there's no divination that will work against Israel. No word of cursing will uh, amount to anything against them. However, if God's own people sin against him, then he'll chastise them. So that's what Balaam counsels Balak to do. And so later, when Israel routs them, Balak or Balaam dies in the process too. But uh, the, the main point that I wanted you to see so far is that these two oracles are about how God had blessed Israel, is blessing Israel, and he called them out of Egypt. Because now I want, to use, want you to see what Balaam does in his last two oracles. And now you're going to start to see something of the significance of this especially in relation to Proverbs. We've already seen some things, but now you're going to see, and, and it's going to grow. It's going to grow and grow. All right. So don't, don't tune out. This, this isn't for the faint of heart. I know I, I, I spend long hours doing this, but maybe that's a way of, uh, not casting pearls before swine, right? The people that don't have the stamina won't stick around and listen or won't continue to plod through as the time is available to them. I don't know. Uh, but uh, I'm hoping that people will uh, put forth the effort and hear these things through to the end because it really takes doing a lot of work to see a lot of this stuff that I'm trying to bring out. All right. So this is the second of the four oracles. Uh, then 
um, uh, Balak complains again, and uh, you have the whole scene playing out again, where uh, uh, where Balaam wants him to try again, or Balak wants Balaam to try again. So in Oh, so Balaam has blessed Israel. Now we get into chapter 24, and it says, When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go as at other times to seek omens, but he set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe, and the Spirit of God came upon him. He took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam the son of Beor, and the oracle of the man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down, yet having his eyes uncovered. How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out like gardens beside the river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from his buckets, and his seed will be by many waters. So it's talking about how Israel will flourish. And his king will be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. So in the prior or oracles, it focused on Israel. Now you begin to see it's, it's talking about Israel, but it starts talking about Israel's king. Okay, it says, his king shall be higher than Agag. That was a pagan king during the time of David. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. Notice this. It's the same language found back in Numbers 23, but it changes it a little bit. God brings him out of Egypt. He is for him like the horns of the wild ox. Remember, back in Numbers 23, it says God brings them out of Egypt. It's talking about the nation, the people. But here, contextually, it's talking about the king. And so it switches to the singular, whereas before it had been plural, now it's singular. In, in the ensuing context, after mentioning the king. So now what is it doing? What is it that Balaam's third oracle is doing? It's giving you a precedent for what Matthew does with Hosea. It's telling you that what God did with Israel, he's going to do later in, in another figure, namely Israel's king. Just like Israel, God's son, was brought out of Egypt, in the future, God will bring him, the king, his son, out of Egypt. So here you have the precedent. Again, this is something that Jews themselves picked up on. I'm not going to quote all the references. You'll have to go watch the series where I spoke about this in more detail. But this was the sort of thing that the Jews picked up on. And so they looked at Israel and said, what did God do with Israel? How did Israel fail? That gives us an insight of what God's going to do through his son and how his son, by contrast, is going to prevail where she failed. Okay, Here, Balaam switches from speaking about the nation to speaking about the individual, the king. God brings him out of Egypt. He is for him like the horns of the wild ox. Now watch what Balaam does. He makes another intertextual connection pointing backwards that we shouldn't miss. It says he'll devour the nations who are his adversaries. He will crush their bones in pieces and shatter them with his arrows. He couches he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who dares rouse him? Okay? Who dares rouse him? Now, when you hear that language, he couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who dares rouse him? What is that a reference to? It's identifying this figure. It's telling you who this one is, this king that is to come. It's picking up the language of Genesis 49, is it not? Here's Genesis 49. This is a prophecy, which, by the way, this will be important later. In the context of this, this is Jacob prophesying over the 12 sons, the 12 tribes, and he specifically says that this prophecy concerns the latter days. 
okay, the end days, the, the days that end the old covenant, right, that inaugurate the new covenant and that will ultimately, you know, encompass this whole interadvental period up until the last day, okay? But here's what it says to Judah. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who dares to rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, the nations, right? The goyim. He ties his foal to the vine. By the way, this is going to be echoed later by another prophet, right? He ties his foal to the vine, his donkey's colt to the choice vine. Who echoes that later? It's Zechariah, of course, right? Zechariah 9. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are, are dull from wine and his teeth white from milk. Now, what is all of this doing? And, and there's, we're going to see more of this, but what is this doing? One of the things that this intertextual stuff does is it allows you to fill out the picture of the Messiah. You can't just say that this text refers to this person, this text refers to that person, when they're being tied together in the Old Testament. They're all being tied together so that you see this is not talking about different people, but one person. Okay, If this text, text A, is connected to text B, and text B is connected to text C, and text C is connected to text D, and text D is connected to B, and then text F is connected to C, right? and you, you've got this network of intertextual connections, then you have this glorious picture being made. And that rules out then saying, when you look at one passage, saying, oh, this could fit this person. Well, the problem is it's not just getting this text to fit this person. You've got to get all these texts to fit the individual. So you can't say, oh, this text was fulfilled in Moses, or this text was fulfilled in David, or this text was fulfilled in Hezekiah. You've got to make all of these texts fit this one specific individual. That's something that the intertextual uh, nature of Scripture is, uh, does for us. But it also, by virtue of one prophet picking up the language of an earlier prophet, one of the things that you know is if this language is being echoed by a later prophet, then no intervening individual, I mean, no individual that comes between the time of the prophecy, the original prophecy, and its later echo, no individual that comes before the later echo could be the fulfillment of the earlier reference. He can't be the fulfillment of that earlier reference if a later prophet comes along and echoes it as if it's still unfulfilled, as if it's still future. So if you have a later prophet echoing Genesis 49, like Balaam in Numbers 24, you know that that prophecy hasn't been fulfilled. If you have Zechariah coming along and echoing Genesis 49, you know that prophecy has not yet been fulfilled, and therefore neither has Numbers 24 because Numbers 24 is about that figure. So I hope you see the point, and I hope you see the value of this. This is incredibly significant. All right. So you see the connection there. You see the connection with Genesis 49. But notice the Abrahamic covenant is echoed. Blessed is everyone who blesses you, and cursed is everyone who curses you. Who? The king. It's not merely that those who are, are blessed who are who bless Abraham or bless his descendants, specifically it's that descendant, that seed. Those who bless him will be blessed. Okay? Those who curse him will be cursed. The reason Balaam couldn't curse that people is because they're the people of the Messiah. Okay? They're the people to whom God promised to send the Messiah, through whom he would, they, he would come. Okay? He is ultimately the source, source of blessing. He is the blessed one, right? The blessed man of Psalm 1, right? This is the one in whom all men are blessed. Okay, so you have now a connection between Genesis 12, blessed is everyone who blesses you, curses everyone who curses you. So the, the seed promised to Abraham is now connected with the one that was mentioned in Genesis 49 and the one mentioned in Numbers 24. So we're talking about who? The king, the king of Israel. 
But we go on. Oh, I didn't put Genesis 12, but I meant to. <laughs> All right. Um, reading on, that was the third oracle. We're about to read one more. It says, Then Balak's anger burned against Balaam, and he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, but behold, you have persisted in blessing them these three times. Therefore, flee to your place now. I said I would honor you greatly, but behold, the Lord has held you back from honor. Balaam said to Balak, now, by the way, I can't help but, you know, it's interesting to me. Uh, I, I was reflecting earlier today on the fact that to me, it's, it's, it's amazing that uh, I would have 19,000 subscribers, even though by other standards, that's very small, right? There are other people, other channels that have large viewerships. And some people might think that I'm somehow put out by that, right? No, I'm overwhelmed that I have 19,000 subscribers. To me, that is incredible. But I know that all along the way, I have refused to compromise, which would have brought more subscribers, right? I, I look at a number of other channels that I know these, these individuals do not have a firm conviction of the truth of the gospel. They, they don't have uh, a commitment to it. They're willing to compromise. I've, I've refused to be on certain channels, to be associated with certain people, to do certain things, precisely because I don't see them as people of character. I don't see them as people who will only work with people of character. I don't, you know, but I, I, in all of that, I'm amazed that the Lord has brought 19,000 people that want to view this. But all that said, you know, we're close to 20,000. So get the word out. But uh, yeah, to me, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing blessing. It's an amazing gift to be able to speak to so many people. So I, I, I thank the Lord for that. Uh, but notice, that's, this is the, 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 the very thing that Scripture is teaching. Don't, for the sake of success, compromise. Right? That's a, a, a lesson of practical value from this whole thing. Don't add to God's words. We've learned that from Balaam. And don't be a person for hire. Don't be anxious for following. Don't be anxious for fame. Don't be anxious for monies. Uh, be willing to forego it all if need be. If need be, forego it all. None of it's going to be worth it in the end, right? All these people that are hankering after these things, they're not going to be satisfied. It's all going to turn out the way it turned out for Balaam, who died, perished when the Lord's wrath fell. Okay? Balaam perished, even though... Uh, you know, uh, he's here. Balak is saying, you know, you, you know, you, you, you're blessing these people and he's rebuking him. But Balaam's trying to, to bless him. He's trying to do something in his favor. Right. But the Lord's holding him back. <laughs> so it's not because Balaam doesn't want to curse Israel and, and get all that Balak has promised him. But anyways, uh, Balaam, uh, you know, complains here. He's like, didn't I tell you your messengers with whom you had sent to me saying, though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything contrary to the command of the Lord, either good or bad of my own accord. What the Lord speaks that I will speak. And now behold, I'm going to my people come and I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the days to come. Okay. This phrase, the days to come is the same phrase found in Genesis 49 when Jacob prophesied over his sons and said, this is what's going to come about in the latter days. It's the same term here. So you could see again, the connection with Genesis 49. Numbers 24 is echoing Genesis 12, the Abrahamic covenant to bless all people through Abraham's seed. It's echoing Genesis 49. And it's saying that the King Messiah would in some sense recapitulate and accomplish what Israel was doing and failed in. Uh, and, and all of these things we're told in these passages pertain to the latter days. Here's his discourse. He took up his discourse and said, the oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, and the oracle of the man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the vision of the Almighty falling down, yet having his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. You remember earlier in the first two oracles focused on the nation, 
how it mentions him seeing Israel standing on the cliffs and, and, and so forth. Israel was before his gaze. Well, here it's still talking about the king. It says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. In other words, he sees him in vision. They're not literally before his gaze. They are presented to him in prophecy. So this one is one who's going to come, as it already said, in the latter days. Okay, so this is eschatological, messianic and eschatological. It pertains to the Messiah, the promised king, the anointed one, and it refers to the days of the end. In fact, just the phrase, the latter days, the end days, tells you that these things can't have reference to David or Solomon or Hezekiah or anybody else. It has to refer to the Messiah. These are messianic to the core. They point to the definitive end of something, ultimately the end of the Old Covenant, the inauguration of the New, which the prophets will spell out in greater detail. But notice it, it goes on to say, A star shall come forth from Jacob, a scepter shall rise from Israel. A scepter, hearkening back again to Genesis 49. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, the man of peace. Then notice this language. He shall crush through the forehead of Moab, and tear down all the sons of Sheth. You're sh you should be thinking here of Genesis 3.15, where it speaks of the seed of, the ser of him crushing the serpent, and it, it speaks of the enmity that it obtains between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. So the, the, the seed of the woman ultimately being Christ and, and the seed of the serpent being uh, all those who are in him. Here, Moab, which is decidedly opposed to the people of God, uh, is here being likened to the seed of the serpent, and it says that he, this one, will crush the forehead of Moab, echoing Genesis 3.15. So now you have Genesis 3.15 being echoed here, but this one was tied to the Abrahamic promise, the seed promised to Abraham in Genesis 12, and, so, and also Genesis 49. So notice Genesis 3.15, Genesis 12, Ge uh, Genesis 49, Numbers 24, all these texts are about the same individual and all about the latter days. Edom shall be a possession. Seir, its enemies, also will be a possession while Israel performs valiantly and so on. One from Jacob. It's clear it's talking about an individual. One from Jacob shall have dominion and will destroy the remnant from the city. All right. Now we, we move on. We're going to come back to this prophecy, and you're going to see a bunch of stuff you didn't even notice when I read through that. So don't quickly forget numbers. I still haven't shown you some of the more significant connections to Proverbs 30. But what, I, what I've established, the, the one thing that I was trying to get at, and I'm, I'm still arguing this with now this prophecy or the statement with David, Remember, I told you that Jewish people claim that the son of Proverbs 30 is Israel. I've given a number of reasons to think, no, it's, it's not Israel. The passage itself leads us to think that it's some son of God that transcends what could be said about Israel, right? This is a son who's known by means of prophetic insight. It's not something that could be known through ordinary human means. Moreover, in the book of Proverbs, it's the wisdom of God that's portrayed as God's son. So we have an intertextual uh, uh, interpretation of that. But what I've shown you is that Israel itself, from Numbers 23 and 24, is taken a, as a type of another figure, an individual, namely Israel's king. So if Israel is God's son, then all the more her, her uh, king is God's son. Well, now we have the promise that was made to David in 2 Samuel 7. A, a, David has expressed his desire to build a house for God, and God has told David, it's a great desire that you have, but you're not the man for that job, right? You're a man of bloodshed. It'll be your son, Solomon. He'll build the house of the Lord, right? It, it's got to be a man of peace, a man of wisdom. He, he's going to be the one to do it. So David's son... Ultimately, what's what's this pointing to, right? It, it, sure, Solomon is going to build a temple to God. But this, again, I'm, as I'm going to prove to you, is all 
eschatological. It, it, it's pointing much further beyond Solomon to something much greater. That is to one who is truly the son of God and the son of David and who is God's very wisdom. Okay, so here, here's the promise that's made as it's made to David originally. This is 2 Samuel 7. Now, therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, so the prophet's being told to say this to David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name, like the names of the great men who are on the earth. By the way, don't miss this sort of thing. You have all these situations where people were trying to make a name for themselves, make the, their names great. Remember the tower builders? They were trying to make a name for themselves, and God punished them. Balaam is seeking fame, money, power, and God ultimately crushes him. But God tells those who love him, who are people after his own heart, that he will make them a name. He's going to make something out of them. He's promising that to David. Why? Because David's desire ultimately is to glorify God. And so God is going to reward David, okay? not necessarily immediately or in his lifetime, uh, but he is going to ultimately make this a reality. He says, I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you. I will make you a great name like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly, even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your seed after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. Okay. So here it uses the word seed, which as you likely know in Hebrew can be either singular or plural. So sometimes there's ambiguity. Is this talking about many individuals or one? Well, in some cases it's referring to one. In some cases it's referring to many. In some cases it's referring to many who will ultimately lead up to the one. And I would maintain that here, it will have a initial fulfillment in men like Solomon and those after him, but it's ultimately going to terminate in, climax in the Messiah, but we'll, we'll come to that. So here we're, we're told that uh, God is going to establish uh, his kingdom, that is the kingdom of David's seed. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So notice that this kingdom that God is going to establish and this throne will be forever. Now, the lingering question that one could have, if 2 Samuel 7 is all we have, is whether or not this eternal throne will be occupied by the same person or by a endless succession of persons. Okay? One thing we know is that it either has to be occupied by an endless succession if this throne is forever, or it has to be occupied by a person who's forever. Okay. But the prophecy goes on, I'll be a father to him and he'll be a son to me. So this one will, in some sense, be a son of God. Now, Israel was a son of God. I, all the kings of Israel, in some sense, are God's sons. But they're all pointers to the true son of God, the one in whom all sonship is found, right? The one from whom sonship derives. But we'll, we'll come to that. Uh so he says, uh, when he commits iniquity, I'll correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. So that's why I would say, number one, it has to at least have some application to uh, David's descendants short of the Messiah. So those that will come from him prior to the Messiah, because it speaks of them being corrected. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Again, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. All right. Well, here's Psalm 72. I want you to see how David understands this prophecy. We're going to see two examples of how David interprets this. So this is a Psalm of David, Psalm 72. We're also going to look at 2 Samuel 23. So Psalm, or I'm sorry, this is Psalm 89, a Psalm of David. We're going to look at Psalm 72. That's a Psalm of Solomon, and we're going to see how Solomon understands this. But this is Psalm 89. It's a Psalm of David. I will sing of the loving kindness of the Lord forever to all generations. I will make known your faithfulness with my mouth 
For I have said, loving kindness will be built up forever. In the heavens, you will establish your faithfulness. I have made a covenant with my chosen. What's this referring to? I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. Quite obviously, this is a reference to the, the promise that God made in 2 Samuel 7. So explicitly, we have an indication that this, not just an indication, we have an explicit, uh, clear uh, way of showing us that this is reflecting on 2 Samuel 7. I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. The heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in this, the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies is comparable to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord? A God greatly feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all those who are around him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is like you among uh, or who is like you, Almighty Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. Notice you rule the swelling of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Kind of similar to Proverbs 30, it shows that the Lord is sovereign over nature, which is the thrust of those rhetorical questions in Proverbs 30. But it says, You yourself crushed Rahab, Egypt, like one who is slain. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all it contains. So it goes on talking about God and how he's faithful and, and how he's powerful and how he's uh, true to him, his promises. And then in verses 17 and 18, it says, For you are the glory of their strength, and by your favor our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord and our king to the Holy One of Israel. So here, David, reflecting on the promise that God made to him is talking about a perpetual throne and kingdom. And he's obviously talking about the king. So uh, the anointed occupant of that throne it says, once you spoke in vision to your godly ones. So this is now directed to God. Once you spoke in vision to your godly ones and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David, my servant with my holy oil. I have anointed him with whom my hand will be established, my arm also will strengthen him. The enemy will not deceive him, nor the son of wickedness, of Belial, afflict him. But I shall crush his adversaries before him and strike those who hate him. My faithfulness and my loving kindness will be with him, and in my name his horn will be exalted. Notice, I, all, I shall also set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. This goes beyond David. He will cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my deliverance or salvation. It doesn't have to refer to uh, from sin, but it simply deliverance. I also shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My loving kindness I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. So I will establish his seed forever and his throne as the days of heaven. So again, a reference to his seed and throne is, as perpetual if his sons forsake my law so it refers to many descendants and do not walk in my judgments if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments then i will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes but i will not break off my loving kindness from him nor deal falsely in my faithfulness my covenant i will not violate nor will i alter the utterance of my lips once i have sworn by my holiness i will not lie to david remember Numbers 23, God's not a man that he should lie, can't add to his words. God made a promise to David, and he will not lie. So this is subsequent to David, right? This is Psalm 89, after David. It's it's clearly reflecting on this, or excuse me, it's, it's um, well, it's, Psalm 89 is a psalm of Ezra, the Eth, Eth, Ezrahite. Um, so I, I, I was mistaken when I told you it was David. I am going to quote David in a moment here, but this is from uh, Ezra the Ezraite, if I'm not mistaken. Anyways, the psalm is true in any case, right? So here you have this statement that the, the promise to David will be fulfilled. It says, his seed shall endure forever and his throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon and the witness in the sky is faithful. Notice this language now. It's, it's now talking about sun and moon in connection with this. 
Okay, so we still have this lingering idea. We have some suggestions in Psalm in this Psalm that it's it's got in view many descendants of David, but also one who will rule over land and sea, right? One who will set his hand on the sea. This one seems to outstrip all the others. So there's some hints in this Psalm of, of one in particular who will ultimately realize this. Now, at one point in this psalm, after recounting the Lord's faithfulness and his promise to David and the fact that he doesn't lie, the psalmist reflects on the fact that presently, in the time of the psalmist, the throne of David had fallen. And so it looks like the promise made to David has come to an end, and God did not keep his word. Verse 38 says, you have cast off and rejected. You have been full of wrath against your anointed. You have spurned the covenant of your servant. You have profaned his crown in the dust. You have broken down all his walls. You have brought his strongholds to ruin. All who pass along the way plunder him. He has become a reproach to his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his adversaries. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You also turn back the edge of his sword and have not made him stand in battle. So all those promises that were made to David, which can't be thwarted, God is faithful, he doesn't lie. Right now, as we look around us, all of that is not true. It's contradicted by the empirical realities that are on every hand. You have made his splendor to cease. He doesn't quit and cast his throne to the ground. You have shortened the days of his youth. You have covered him with shame. Salah. How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? Remember what my span of life is. For what vanity you have created all the sons of men. What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Salah, can any man do that? Where are your former loving kindnesses, O Lord, which you swore to David in your faithfulness? Remember, O Lord, the reproach of your servants, how I bear in my bosom the reproach of all the many peoples. Notice that this suddenly there's this person speaking in this psalm, looking at the promises made to David and how it all lies in ruins. And even this one who's speaking and, and crying out to God to, to fulfill all of this, he speaks of being a reproach to the peoples. Uh, he says, uh, with which your enemies have reproached, O Lord, with which they have reproached the footsteps of your anointed. Uh, by the way, the Targum here of the verse says, for your enemies have scorned, O Lord, they have scorned the delay of the footsteps of your Messiah. So they recognize this as messianic. So the psalm ends, even as it hinted at points along the way, showing us that the, the covenant is ultimately fulfilled in a specific individual. But let me show you what makes this patently obvious from a, a psalm of Solomon and from a statement of David. This is Psalm 72. It says, and again, it's a, it's a Psalm of Solomon. Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. Now, this is not referring to two different individuals, the, the, the king and his son. It's referring to the king as also the son of the king, right? If he's king, then he's the son of the king. He, he succeeds him. This is a way of referring to a specific individual. Okay, Solomon is talking about an individual, the king, the king's son. And we know that in part because the next verse says, may he judge your people with righteousness. So it's talking about one person. Uh, and that's why, unsurprisingly, again, the Targum says that this was composed by Solomon, uttered in prophecy. And the words that are ascribed in the first verse to Solomon, it says in this way, O oh God, Give your just rulings to the King Messiah and your righteousness to the son of King David. Okay, so this is Solomon praying for God to give his judgments and righteousness to the King Messiah, according to the Targum. He's praying for some individual. May he judge your people with righteousness and you're afflicted with justice. Let the mountains bring peace to the people and the hills in righteousness. May he vindicate the afflicted of the people, save the children of the needy and crush the oppressor, crush the head of the serpent, crush the forehead of Moab. May he crush the oppressor. Let them fear 
him while the sun endures. It's picking up the language of Psalm 89, but now it's talking about clearly one individual. As long as the moon throughout all generations, may he come down like rain upon the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days, may the righteous flourish and abundance of peace till the moon is no more. Right? And, and by the way, scripture speaks of, of sun and moon as, as perpetual. And, and so it's speaking of a perpetual reign for this individual. He's going to reign forever. Um, verse 8 says, May he also rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Again, you have this language of the, uh, the sea from sea to sea, right? To put his hand on the sea and on the land and so forth. May he reign from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now, this language of the ends of the earth ought to sound familiar to you. Why should it sound familiar? Because it's used in Proverbs 30, right? Who has established the ends of the earth? This language is used to refer to the, the you know, what God created. He created all the ends of the earth, right? He's the creator of the ends of the earth, Isaiah 40. The Messiah will rule over the nations. Uh, Psalm 2, 8 says, ask of me and I'll give you the nations as your, as your inheritance, the ends of the earth as your possession. Okay, that's what this language is, is doing. It's establishing uh, that this one is the sovereign over these things. May he rule from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. And uh, by the way, uh, I mentioned Zechariah uh, 9 earlier. Remember I mentioned where Zechariah 9 talks about the king of Israel coming in, riding on a donkey and on the colt, the foal of a donkey. Well, that passage goes on after talking about the king and him coming lowly and then transitions to talk about what he'll do. Uh, you know, it's, it's like you've got these two contrasting pictures of this one is one of peace. But then it, it transitions to talk about him uh, exercising his mighty power. And so we would explain this in terms of his first and second comings. But it goes on the very next verse after it talks about his humble coming. It then says uh, he will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the bow of war will be cut off. So it's saying he'll, he'll establish peace by vanquishing all opposition. And it says he will speak peace to the nations and his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. It's quoting Psalm 72, right? But what is Psalm 72 echoing? Psalm 72 is echoing the covenant made to David. And it's echoing Psalm 89. So if, if these Psalms are related to each other, and if they're related to Numbers 24 and other passages, well then, again, we've got this intricate series of interconnections. All right, the Psalm goes on. He will deliver the needy when he cries for help, the afflicted also, and him who has no helper. He will have compassion on the poor and needy, and the lives of the needy he will save. He will rescue their life from oppression and violence, and their blood will be precious in his sight. The blood of Christ's people this is a precious verse. The blood of his people are precious in his sight. So may he live and may the gold of Sheba be given to him and let them pray for him continually. Let them bless him all day long. May there be abundance of grain in the earth on the top of the mountains. Its fruit will wave like the cedars of Lebanon and may those from the city flourish like vegetation of the earth. May his name endure forever not just his throne not just his kingdom may his name endure forever his name increase as long as the sun endures and let men bless themselves by him let all nations call him blessed what is that an echo of that's an echo of genesis 12 numbers 24 the promise to abraham that all would be blessed in him those who bless him would be blessed and so forth which was echoed in numbers 24 is here echoed in psalm 72 in its explanation of the promise made to David about his greater son, all of it talking about the Messiah. Okay. Don't tell me these prophecies are fulfilled in David when they couldn't be not all of them together. And uh, not all of them because later prophecies after David still expect their fulfillment, right? Don't tell me uh, fulfilled in Solomon or in Hezekiah or anyone else. No, this is waiting the eschatological king, the end of days when he would come. And he would do not just one or two of these things. He'd do all these things, ultimately. 
blessed be the Lord God is how the psalm ends with, on a benediction. The God of Israel who alone works wonders. Blessed be his glorious name forever. All right. Here is 2 Samuel 23. And I, I'm going to start to bring back in. We're going to look at some stuff in 2 Samuel 23, but we're about to start bringing back in Numbers 24 and Proverbs 30. And you're going to see how all this uh, how it all terminates, right? How it, what it was all moving towards, at least what I was trying to get to. This is second Samuel 23. You, you know, if you've been listening to my shows for a while, that there are certain things in the Hebrew that I don't think are well translated by a number of our popular translations I've done shows on it, so you'll have to get the longer version on those shows. Uh, I don't remember what show I've dealt with this passage on at length, but I have. Probably in one of the Psalms series. Probably when dealing with Psalm 1 and 2. So go look for the series on Psalm 1 and 2, or the videos on Psalm 1 and 2, for a longer discussion of this. But on my understanding, and that of... Uh, even the versions and other scholars, this is how 2 Samuel 23 should actually be rendered. It says, these are the last words of David. Okay. Now, now this is interesting, by the way. Th this is an aside. There's not really a question here about how this should be translated, but there is a question that arises here because 2 Samuel 23, for various reasons, doesn't appear to be David's last words says the last words of David, though. So what do we do? I mean, you can go to 1 Kings 2 and find words of David that appear to be after this. What some have said is, well, these are the last of David's inspired words. Okay, Well, maybe. Maybe that's a way of doing this uh, and, and of accounting for the apparent tension. But the way the, the Targums do this and, and, and rabbinic midrashic interpretation does this is instead of taking these as the last words of David, they understand this as a way of saying these are the words of David about the end. Okay, so here's why this is interesting, because on the one hand, as it stands, taking these as the last words of David, so words that David is speaking as he's about to expire, it seems to make a connection in some sense to Proverbs 30, doesn't it? In Proverbs 30, we had the potential idea that 30 verse 1 was Agur saying that he's spent, he's worn, he's about to end, right? His, his, his life is coming to its, its uh, end point. And so those were like his last words. Well, here's David's last words. And wouldn't it be interesting if there was some sense in which we saw that in numbers? Well, in any case, the, the way the Jews understand this, we know there's a connection to numbers because they take this to be an indication that these are about the last days. Okay? These are about the end days. What we saw, we've seen explicitly in Numbers 24, it's about the latter days. In any case, what we know from the rest of the context, it's clear that this is talking about the Messiah because it goes on to say, the utterance of David, the son of Jesse, the utterance of the man who was raised concerning the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. Okay, so David says here that this, uh, that he was raised up in order to write these songs about the anointed one. He was raised up concerning him. He's he's writing in, in his psalms about him. That's that's the, the major reason why God raised him up. Okay, for this reason, to write about the anointed one. So David's telling you what Jesus told us. David's telling you that he wrote about Jesus in the Psalms. What was written about me in the law of Moses and in the Psalms and in the prophets must be fulfilled. David's telling you he wrote concerning the Messiah. Okay, but now notice this. I hope you were paying attention and I hope you didn't quickly forget what I had already mentioned. It says, the utterance of David, the son of Jesse. Do you remember when I told you that the word utterance used in Proverbs 30 is used hundreds of times? It's, it's used hundreds of times almost always for 
the Lord. The, the Lord is the subject. The Lord declares. The Lord utters, right? So it's always a word that refers to a divine utterance. So it's surprising that a word like this would be used for any human being. Well, it is used in three cases. One is in Proverbs 30. One is here, the last words of David. The other is yet to be seen. So already, if you're getting to Proverbs 30 and you know how the word utterance is used, you're, you're thinking to yourself, well, that's just strange. It, it doesn't normally use this for a human being. Oh, well, except in these two other cases, David and this other one that I'm going to show you in a moment. And so you might be thinking, I wonder what these passages could have to do with each other. They're all described as an utterance, which is only otherwise ascribed to God. Okay? The utterance of David, notice it also goes out of its way to call him the son of Jesse. It doesn't always do that, right? It, it doesn't always identify who a person is the son of, but here it does. It says the utterance of David, the son of Jesse. Then it goes on to say, the man who was raised concerning the anointed of the God of Jacob. So he's called the man, Ha-Geber, right? That's the word Gibor. It's only, I mean, it's used all sorts of times, but when it has the definite article, it's only used a dozen times. So here you have a cluster of terms, one of which is almost always used for God, except in three cases. And it's used with this uh, I mean, it says the son of Jesse and the man, Hageber. You, you only find this cluster of things, not only the word neum, utterance, used for a man three times, you only find this cluster three times. Here and in Proverbs 30 and in one other case that I'm going to show you in a moment. Right? Here it is in Proverbs, the words of Agur. We've already seen it. The son of Jacha. The man, Hagibor, declares, Neum, right? The same cluster that's only found three times and a word that's only used for a human being three times. Clearly, the author wants you to think of these earlier references. That's why it's not surprising when later in the context of this oracle, right? This oracle, he talks about not adding to God's words and not being drawn aside by wealth and fame and all the rest, like Balaam, right? There's, there's intertextual evidence galore here. That's why, you know, that phrase I said, if it means this, I'm weary, O God, and worn out, or at my end, is, is potentially significant in its connection to 2 Samuel 23. All right, so this, this prophecy, uh, he, he talks about how he was raised up to write about the Messiah. In verse 2, it says, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. His word was on my tongue. Now watch this. I know that I've talked about this text before, but I don't think I've brought out some other the elements that, that could have been brought out. So if you've heard me before, you kind of tuned out for a minute, tune back in because I'm going to show you something I, I haven't mentioned before. So, so David has been described here as the man raised up concerning the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. And so then he begins to speak. The spirit of the Lord spoke by me. His word was on my tongue. Okay. So clearly a prophetic utterance. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. There you have Hebrew parallelism. The spirit who spoke is called the God of Israel, right? Verse two, the spirit, verse three, God. He who, here's what the, the Lord said. He who rules over men righteously, who rules in the fear of God, is as the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, when the tender grass springs out of the earth through sunshine after rain. Doesn't that sound like the Psalms we read earlier? <laughs> this, is, this one, this ruler, is as the light of the morning when the sun shines, a morning without clouds, when the tender grass springs out of the earth through sunshine after rain. It sounds like a figure mentioned in Psalm 72, Psalm 89, and so many other places. David is talking about the Messiah here. Notice in verse 5, it says, Surely, he makes these this series of interjections, Surely, my house is not so with God. Well, what David is saying here, and, and this is a point where translations, I think, botch it, they often make this a question, but it's not a question in Hebrew. It, they, they make it like David is saying, surely is not my house so with God? 
right? Is Does this description not fit me in my house? No, what David is saying is this is the description of the Messiah, but it doesn't fit me. It doesn't fit my house. I am not like this, right? This one is altogether righteous. This one is like the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds. Okay, he's the source of renewal for the earth when the tender grass springs out of the earth through sunshine after rain. This one is like dew upon the grass, David is saying. But it's not so with me in my house. But, he says, the, you have the, the word key here, but or for. This is why David is, is being told this, is, is the, the upshot. He's, he's being told this about the anointed one for, uh, because, you know, it, it's explaining all of this. He has made an everlasting covenant with me, ordered in all things and secured. For all my salvation, all my desire, uh, this is, con con I, wrote it, I wrote it wrong, but... Um, it actually should say, um, it says, surely is not my house so with God, but it sh should say, surely my house is not so with God. And the last part is actually not a question either. It's for all my salvation and all my desire, surely he will not make it grow. That is for all David's desire to bring about that salvation that was promised through the seed of Abraham, the seed of the woman, the, the, the descendant of Judah, for all David's desire to accomplish all that and to, to be that man, God says he's not that man, right? But that man is coming. God has promised it to David. Notice what it says in verses 6 and 7. But the worthless, every one of them will be thrust away like thorns, literally in Hebrew, it's singular, a thorn. They'll be thrust away like a worthless thorn because they cannot be taken in hand. But the man who touches them must be armed with iron and the shaft of a spear, and they will be completely burned with fire in their place. So here's David. Uh, it's, so, it's so beautiful. But by the way, uh, when it says worthless here, the worthless, it's literally Belial. When Paul in the New Testament says, what does Christ have to do with Belial? It goes back to passages that make reference to Belial, but are translated poorly, worthless, or sometimes it'll say sons of worthlessness or sons of wickedness, which means sons of Belial. So here it's talking about Belial and his seed, okay? The worthless, that is Belial, and every one of them, that is all his offspring, will be like a thorn. But it speaks of, it's talking in context ultimately about the Messiah, the anointed one, who will spring from David in fulfillment of the covenant God made to him. And it says that the wicked, Belial and his seed, will be like a thorn. And so the man who touches them, which man? The king, the anointed one, must be armed with iron. Who is it that's armed in this way, right? He shall rule them with a rod of iron, right? And, and what's going to happen to those wicked people that oppose the Messiah? Psalm 1 tells us. Right. They're going to be burned up like chaff. Right. And, and blown away by the wind. Right. They're, they're like thorns and thistles, that, the chaff that the wind drives away. They're thorns. So, again, you, you have this idea. No wonder David in the psalm speaks like this. It's, it, this is characteristic David language. Right. And it's all being derived from that promise that God made to him and through further revelations of the spirit. So. David speaks of the man who's armed with iron who will, uh, or they will be completely burned with fire. Now we come back to the prophecy of Balaam. Now watch this. Watch. Uh, I've been showing you all sorts of connections along the way. Wait until you see a bunch of connections that you didn't. Okay, so here, this is Numbers 24. We're just zeroing in on Numbers 24. Notice it speaks of Balaam prophesying by the Spirit of God, what we just saw in 2 Samuel 23. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, right? It says that Balaam took up his discourse and said. Now, what's interesting, remember I told you before how strange it is to find oracles at the end of the book of Proverbs? They seem to be out of place in terms of their genre. Well, there's actually a good reason why these might be included in the book of Proverbs. Okay, The, the word for Proverbs is found elsewhere in Scripture. Uh, sometimes translated discourse <clears throat> or proverb or parable, right? It's the same word used in 
Proverbs 1, 1, Proverbs 1, 6, Proverbs 10, 1, right? It's the word for the book of Proverbs and the Proverbs that it contains. So in the book of Proverbs, you have this oracle, which you don't expect to be there. But then you have this intertextual connections to Balaam, right? All the other things I mentioned about uh, not adding to God's word and all this, you're going to see a bunch more. It, it Back when Balaam talks about taking up his discourse, he uses the same word. And so already somebody reading this who's read Proverbs or somebody who's reading Proverbs who read this will possibly think of this text, especially in light of the other intertextual connections. So notice the first oracle, the oracle of Balaam. Wait a minute. What is the word here for oracle? Neum. This is the, uh, the third oracle occasion i told you there were three exceptions to those hundreds of references to the utterances of jehovah okay the naum yahweh uh, hundreds of times like 366 times or something like that the only exceptions are in connection with balaam david and agar in numbers 24 second samuel 23 and proverbs 30 okay but notice what else the oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor. Wait, the oracle of David, the son of Jesse. The oracle of Agur, the son of Yacheh, right? Would you be surprised if it goes on to call Balaam the man, ha Gibor? The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the man. Again, only found in two other places, 2 Samuel 23 Proverbs chapter 30. What I'm driving at that should be painfully obvious now is that the son of Proverbs, the wisdom of God in Proverbs 8, the son of the Lord in Proverbs 30, is the Messiah, the one who already we were told would be the son of God and the son of David. Right? We have all these intertextual connections. There, there's more, by the way, um, just to show you this again. There's all those terms that are that are now repeated in the case of uh, uh, Balaam. But notice this. This is interesting. In Proverbs 30, in verse 2, when it says, Surely I am more stupid than any man. The pronunciation of that is Ba'ar. But the consonants are actually the same as the name of... Uh, Balaam's father. I guess I didn't put it here, but when it calls him the son of Beor, the, the consonants are the same. So somebody reading this in Hebrew, even though they'd know it's a different word, because contextually it doesn't make sense any other way, they would still have this, uh, they'd see this word that looks like Beor, which is the father of, of Balaam. Okay, so there's another intertextual connection. But notice, Numbers 24 goes on uh to say water will flow from his buckets, his seed will be by many waters. Oops. I guess I didn't put it, but I meant to. Um, well, I got, I'm going to have to come back to something, but okay. Verse 15, again, it says he took up his discourse. It's, it's and it, well, and it says the oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor. So it's repeated twice, right? So he's, there's two oracles at the end in, uh, in Numbers 24. And in both cases, we have the same set of phenomena that we find in 2 Samuel 23 and Proverbs 30. So clearly these texts are intertextually related. Um, now, okay, here's what I meant to get to. So in Numbers 24, when it says, his king shall be higher than Agag and his kingdom shall be exalted, I mentioned that Agag was a king during the time of David. Now, the problem, though, is it, it doesn't make a lot of sense in a context which is eschatological, referring to a future descendant of David, because of all the things we've already seen, right? There are prophecies that tie in with this after David, after Solomon, after Hezekiah, after all these people, and so looking forward to a future king. So it, it's problematic to find the, the fulfillment of this in David, and so it, it, it's interesting, though this king was somebody at the time of David, which leads some Jews to say this is talking about David. 
if you look at the consonantal text, it's easy to see how somebody could have mistaken a different word here for agag. In Hebrew, it says me agag, so it has the mem preposition at the front of it. And I mean, that's just so you have agag, and uh, it's well, it's using it as a comparative here, it's higher than agag. And so the, the mem would not be, it's not part of the name, it's just joined to the name to make this point of comparison. So what you have is Aleph Gimel Gimel. What looks very similar to this, what would be written very similar to this, is the word for Gog. Okay. Now, who is Gog? Gog is not a past enemy of Israel at least not from the perspective of the Torah or later prophets. Gog in the Old Testament is always some future enemy. Okay? Gog refers to the end-time enemy of Israel. And this text is explicitly about the end. Remember, right? Numbers 24, he says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the latter days. So it's talking about the distant future. I see him, but not now, right? All of this is in the future. So it's, it wouldn't be surprising, given the similarity between Agag and Gog, if somebody misunderstood the reference. When we look at the Septuagint, it actually says Gog. Okay, So the, the Jewish translators of this recognize that the one in view here was Gog. Okay, The kingdom of God shall be exalted, his kingdom shall be increased. But contextually, when you read it in the Septuagint, the idea is that the king Messiah is going to uh, dominate him and subject him or subdue him. Okay. Now, one of the things that supports the uh, Septuagint reading is a later re or a reference in Ezekiel 38. Notice what it says. It's, it's talking here about Gog. And notice what it says in Ezekiel 38, 17. Thus says the Lord God, are you the one of whom I spoke in former days through my servants, the prophets of Israel? Okay, so now I want you to think about something for a moment. First of all, and this this isn't doesn't require a whole lot of mental de dexterity, right? First of all, he says, "Are you the one of whom I spoke in former days through my servants the prophets?" This means that there must be prior references to Gog. Well, I'll challenge you to find references to Gog prior to Ezekiel, if you don't recognize Balaam and Moses recording Balaam speaking of Gog. Okay. Now there's one other reference, which would account for a plural prop servants, right? Which is an Amos, but uh, I don't want to get into that right now. But the point is that you need, right? You need a prior reference in addition to Amos, such as we find in Numbers 24, in order to account for this. There is no other reference to Gog if this is not in there. Okay. So there's inner there, there's inner biblical reason to go with the Septuagintal rendering, okay, and that is also consistent with the fact that Numbers 24 is said to be about the latter days, okay. Remember it says here, in the days to come, this is Numbers 24:14. Behold, I'm going to my people come, and I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the days to come. Uh, by the way, oh. Here's what I was going to say. It, it makes uh, re requires some, you know, not just casual thought. I mean, it's not really, you know, all that difficult. I'm setting it up more than I, I should. Uh, but when when Ezekiel 38 says, are you the one I spoke of in former days? OK, what are former days or what are days called after them? OK, if those are the former days then the days after them are the after days, right? Or the latter days. And that's literally what the Hebrew expression latter days is, after days. Okay, That's the term that's used in these passages. So when God in Ezekiel says, when I spoke about in former days, it's referring to the times of the Exodus. And then the after days, later days, refers then to uh, the times of the Messiah and so forth. Okay, so... Here, here's an interesting little tidbit in the Septuagint when it refers to the latter days in places like this. It uses the word that we get eschatology from, right? The study of end times or the end days, eschaton. 
All right. So here again, it says he took up his proverb or parable. He'll crush through the forehead of Moab. Here is, I think this is the end of what I wanted to present to you. It is um, at least what I'm going to present to you today. If I don't do a second series uh, or video on this, but here's the Targum on Psalm or Numbers 24. Notice it's later in the chapter, but it says uh, the armies of Gog who will do battle against Israel. But it speaks of, it says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but it is not near. When the mighty king of Jacob's house shall reign and the Mashiha or Messiah, the power scepter of Israel be anointed. He will slay the princes of the Moabi and bring to nothing all the children of Sheth. The armies of Gog who will do battle against Israel and all their carcasses shall fall before him and the Edomite and so forth. So what is, what is the conclusion of all of this? <laughs> Latter-day Saints. I, first thing I see is Hervey. <laughs> so what, what is the grand conclusion? Well, by this point, I think I've made the concluding summary number of times. And I think you could have wrapped this all up yourself, but let me just do so to make sure I, I don't fail to connect all the dots. In, in Proverbs 30, what do we have? We have a text that echoes two prior texts, Numbers 24 and 2 Samuel 23. Clearly, these texts are intended to be read together. We are to read these texts as building upon e each other. They are filling out a picture. There are certain things in common between these texts that evoke the other. So when one text says something, it fills out the picture. You can't pretend that somebody who fits the bill of, of one of these texts is that figure if he doesn't also fit the bill of these other texts. Also, you can't say that he fulfills them if a later reference to them comes after that individual, right? If that is, individual's already passed from the scene, then you know that prior prophecy wasn't fulfilled because the later one makes reference to it. So in Proverbs 30, you have this text that's talking about a future individual and the knowledge that's being conveyed goes beyond what could ordinarily be understood by human means. It's divine knowledge. It's heavenly insight. So it pertains to a son uh, that, uh, you know, couldn't be any ordinary son. It's the son of the Lord and, and one who, who's the knowledge of him is only by means of divine revelation. Okay. That same one who's spoken of in Numbers 24, who's the scepter that was spoken of in Genesis 49, the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? The one who has promised to bring blessing to the world through in Genesis, the seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15, the one mentioned in Psalm 72 by David, whose throne will endure forever, whose name will endure forever, the one who will set his hand on the sea and rule over all the ends of the earth, right? Uh, all of this bespeaks the son, the son of Psalm 2, right? The son of uh, Psalm 2, the one who was begotten according to Psalm 110, which ties in with Proverbs 8, right? And Psalm 2. There's three texts in the Old Testament that talk about a figure being begotten of God, uh, an anti-mundane begetting. That is a begetting that is pre-temporal. It, it, it's true apart from the world, has nothing to do with created reality and the kind of begetting that takes place there. This is the Lord begetting a son, you know, prior to the creation of everything, right? That's mentioned in Psalm 110.3 in the Hebrew text. He was begotten before the day star, the, the morning of creation. Uh, Psalm 2.7, this day have I begotten you. Proverbs 8, right? I was uh, begotten by him. Uh, so, this is the son of Proverbs 30, right? This is why Tovia and Michael Skoback are out to lunch when they try and claim that it's Israel or anybody else other than the Lord Jesus Christ in whom we find fulfilled just this, a son who is himself true deity and also the son of David. He is both David's son and David's Lord. He's the son of God and the son of man. All right, I see somebody gave me this here super chat somewhere along the way. 
Um, Freedthinker says, Bryson Gray is on God's Logic page right now. They're debating the Trinity. Pre please try to jump on. So it's that was set at 11.26. Oh, man, it's been half an hour. Um, I am about to wind down here. Um, I, I Let me ask you this. Is uh, vocab on there? Out of curiosity? Out of curiosity, because uh, vocab called me yesterday, and he mentioned that he was going to be talking with the Unitarian, and he mentioned Bryson Gray. So I wonder, I wonder, I'm, I'm pretty sure that vocab's on there with him. That's interesting. Um, I didn't know it was today. Um, Vlad says, thank you, Anthony, for your teachings and sharing your deep knowledge. Every time you teach, I grow in love of the Lord and his word. My spirit leaps for joy, grace and peace to you and your family. Thank you so much. And so let me tell you, I'm glad you said that because even though I don't mention it, this is exactly the goal. I mean, part of the goal. There, there's more, but I'm always thinking, you know, one of the reasons that somebody could actually entertain the notion that something needs to supplement God's word is if they have a lacuna in their understanding of scripture. Even if they pretend that it's deep and all these other things and that they're bringing out depths, the only reason that somebody can go chasing after something else as though it could fill in you know, what they lack from God's word is if they don't really see the riches of scripture. And so one of the things I'm always hoping is that people will see, hey, look, you don't need any other word. When somebody comes along telling you, listen to this, listen to this pope, listen to this guy with this funny hat, you know, hey, look, we're, our church is very old, right? We had a church over here for 2000 years, right? Never mind the fact that some churches that were five years old were considered apostate by the apostles. Never mind the fact that we know from those churches themselves that they reject other ancient churches as apostate, right? The fact that they're old, you should listen to them. They know what they're talking about. You don't need an additional word. Plumb the depths of scripture. You'll never come to an end of it, okay? When the psalmist in Psalm 19 and Psalm 119 extols the glories of the word, something you'd never find, produced in a Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic context. They just don't speak that way. In fact, I have nothing but one endless list of disparaging comments from these people about the word of God, constantly denigrating it and criticizing the statements that I'm making about its uh, you know, superlative nature. This is the very speech of God. Denigrating it, demoting it beneath some man or church is blasphemous effrontery against the Lord. God's word is rich, it's deep, and uh, when people uh, tell you to go hankering after something else, they're doing so because they don't understand it. It is to them a, a closed book, right? And, and it's not beautiful at the end of the day. Again, they might use the words beautiful. They know they have to say stuff like this sometimes. They've got to keep up appearances, right? It's kind of like a person who's not good to his wife and, and his family, but talks well about them uh, in front of others and, you know, and, and all this and that. You know, it's... It, it, that's the way they are. They know they've got to talk like that. But at the end of the day, they don't believe it's sufficient. They don't believe it's an inexhaustible wellspring of eternal life, which the Bible says that it is. It is through Scripture that we know Christ, right? And they like to set up this dichotomy between Christ and his word. You know, you, you idolize the Bible. You know, Jesus is the word of God. We don't know the living word, Jesus, apart from his written word, which itself is not communicated to us as a dead letter, but by his spirit, right? The spirit is active in this word, right? So pretending that you can bifurcate between Christ and his word and, and diminish one and minimize its significance just doesn't fly. Not if you're going to be biblical, right? So I'm always trying, I'm hoping that people will understand from what I'm saying that scripture is all that it's cracked up to be. When, when second Timothy three sixteen says all scripture is given by inspiration of God or is God breathed and then goes on to say, and is profitable, meaning therefore is profitable for doctrine, reproof for correction, for training in righteousness. And, and how much so, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. When it says that, it's it's precisely because it's this word, this word of God that's this rich, this this full, this deep. Only that word is, uh, well, kind of forgot what I started. <laughs> what I'm getting at is that you, you can't minimize this word. It, it It is life to us. Your word is truth. Sanctify them by your truth, Jesus said. 
Your words are spirit and they are life, Jesus says. These people treat scripture like it's a dead word. It isn't. It is very the very life of Christ's people. This is how Christ primarily, principally nourishes us, is on his word. All right. Joshua Springer says, Sam is challenging you now live. Please, for the sake of Christ and truth, go on. He's challenging me where? It's 11 o'clock. Let me see my uh, um, <laughs> of course he's challenging me. You know, I've noticed curiously that many of the challenges to, to debate him right now have been when I'm live. <laughs> How convenient. Let me uh, I have a uh, I have a source that uh, normally keeps me informed of things. Nobody has told me otherwise that Sam is challenging me. Now, what's what's strange, you say he's challenging me now. What time is it? He was supposed to be having a discussion with Kelly Powers, which I was planning to watch after this. Anyways, um, I, I've made it very clear. So I chased, for the record, I chased those guys for a year and a half of my life right? He kept hiding behind one person after another. And then finally, after 18 months, he decided uh, maybe, maybe he's, he's ready to do something. But then he said only if, if William's there with him, right? So the brothers in arms are only willing to debate if they're holding hands. So quote unquote, brothers in arms, as they call themselves, that, that was the last I knew. And I said, okay, he, here's the deal. So he wanted me to debate him with William and somebody else. It's either me and him debating the topic, is belief in the perpetual virginity of Mary a de fide doctrine? That is something necessary for salvation, because that's what Rome and the East teach. They both teach that those who reject this are heretics and blasphemers and outside of saving uh, faith and so forth. Th that's according to their own documents. Okay, So that's what we debate. I'm not interested in his trifles. right? And here's, here's the further agreement. He can debate with whoever he wants. If he needs William by his side, that's fine. I'm not going in there with anybody else. It's me and him or me and, uh, against him and William. That's, that's the way it goes. Okay, so we debate whether perpetual virginity of Mary is a de fide doctrine, as Rome and the East teach, the apostate churches whose glories he's singing, and we do it me versus him or me versus him and William. Okay. That's that's all there is to it, right? After a year and a half of those guys tucking tail, that's that's what they get. And that's more than magnanimous. All right. All right. So Daniel says question about Ecclesiastes 2, and I do not know offhand. So, Ecclesiastes, oops, Ecclesiastes 2, you said 24 and 25. There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen that it is from the hand of God for who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him. Well, so here, um, I wouldn't say that either one is problematic by any stretch. Uh, the, the phrase hand of God or right arm is used to refer to the Messiah. And it's clearly personified in numerous passages, but also it's possible for things to be idiomatic in places or, or figurative as a trope. And so, I mean, but, but either one theologically is true, right? You, either if you take the hand of God there to be an idiom for God's power, that's true. Everything's from his hand, his, it's by his power. Or if you take it as a reference to the second person of the Trinity, that would be true too. All things are through Christ. At 
at the same time that it's a theological possibility that's available for the interpretation of that text, you, you have passages that explicitly do identify the hand of God or the arm of the Lord as the second person of the Trinity. So I, I just don't know that you can necessarily nail it down there in Ecclesiastes 2. You certainly can't. I don't think you'd get a Unitarian to, to you know, be impressed there. Not that that's why you're asking. I'm just saying I, I, it's not a proof I would go to like I would Isaiah 51, Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53 to show that it's the Messiah in many contexts or Isaiah 63. So that, that's what I would say there. I, it, it, easy enough to take it as a figure of speech, but it's not problematic if you also see a further connection to Christ. Um, Petrus says, is there anything significant about 666 as it appears in Revelation other than the number value? That is the character's resemblance to the Arabic word for Allah. So I, I have heard that, uh, that. A lot of that was uh, years ago. I don't remember exactly the form of the argument. Oh, and by the way, I, I did see that um, I did see that Hussein Mashni left me a super chat earlier, and I'm sorry, Hussein, I meant to mention it uh, and now it's way back there, but I, I, I was, I was trying to remind myself when I went off into these other things to mention that. So thank you so much if I didn't, but, um, I remember people trying to draw a picture of some Arabic letters and a sword or, or whatever, and, and, or try and make the Greek look similar to some Arabic symbols or, uh, and it, it's, it does, it doesn't work. I mean, I know it, it's, when we see that sort of thing, it's tantalizing. You know, it seems like a very easy thing for us to find and be able to use against Islam. But it's it's just not true. And, you know, I don't take the whole approach anyways that many people do that would make it relevant. To, I mean, the whole book, I just don't think is is relevant to what most people think, right? It's a, it's a whole other topic, but I, I don't think it works. And it's been a while though, since I've seen that, I just don't think that you can make a connection between the way 666 looks and uh, certain things. But um, again, it's been a while. I just, I forget how people try to do it. As, as a best I recall, they, they try and write it a certain way and make it look like a sword or something like that. But what it says in Greek is 600, three score, and six. And it's talking about the numerical value of a person's name, the numerical value of an individual, one of the heads of the beast. And so it, it's simply, quite simply, whether, you know, it, it has to in some way make sense in that way. If it's going to make further sense, fine but it has to at least do that it has to be the numerical value of a person's name um all right shamu says uh he's not accepting their lies but he won't stop talking to this woman because he finds her to be beautiful i know the heart that she oh well i don't know what you guys are talking about there so <laughs> looks like looks like i got into a discussion of uh um yeah, this is a good comment here um william says since mary was righteous she would have followed the mandate be fruitful and multiply uh hence jacob the just yeah um so for those that don't know, James in Greek is actually Jacob, but for whatever reason has conventionally been translated as James. Um, so the point here that's being made is, I mean, it's just, it's unheard of in Israel for, for a woman to not have children was not considered a good thing. Every woman wanted to have children. And that was a goal in marriage. Now, if people couldn't have children, then, you know, they couldn't have children, but th that was a hope. And it was always considered a bad thing if they couldn't. So for Mary to come along and not want to have children and for Joseph to marry her without that, pro I mean, just that doesn't make any sense. Plus, she's not fulfilling her marital obligations, right? 
Paul said to the Corinthians that the man's body belongs to his wife and his wife's body belongs uh, to him. They have co uh, marital obligations to each other. So if Mary wasn't faithful to Joseph in that way, then she didn't uh, fulfill that. How, how could she be a righteous woman? That, that's essentially what William's talking about. And by the way, this is one of the problems that Roman Catholics often struggle with because they're, if you read their books trying to defend Mariolatry, they will try and show that it could be possible. It could be possible for a woman to make a vow of perpetual virginity. And of course, they never come up with any real examples of that. What they'll get at best are people who make a vow of a very temporary sort, right, within marriage not to have relations for a limited, a very limited period of time. Paul talks about it in his uh, correspondence to the Corinthians when he, he says, um, you know, to, not to separate except for a time, right, for prayer. And, you know, so for certain pious reasons, they could for a, a while abstain, but th that had to have a, an end. And you don't get anything elsewhere you know you you might have you have you might have somebody that makes a vow not to get married but you don't have a vow of a person to be celibate within marriage it's just unheard of in israel you don't get married to remain celibate right that it's just it doesn't make any sense so they try and as much as they can uh smuggle in notions that are foreign to the bible but uh um all right. Let's see. So Slam says her sword is longer than Williams. I guess we're having a sword contest. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty clever, though. By the way, one of my... I, I skipped over it, but when I was talking about Numbers 22 and the angel of the Lord appears. You have an intertextual connection there between the angel of the Lord and the captain of the Lord's hosts in Joshua five, because that's the only text where you have a heavenly figure bearing a sword and he's bearing a sword right in numbers 22 and the captain of the Lord's hosts, the arm captain of the armies of heaven is bearing a sword in Joshua five. So you have an inter interesting intertextual connection, which is already made anyways, because Joshua 5 is intertextually connected to Exodus 3, right? But in both texts, they're told, remove the sandals on your feet for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. That's what Moses is told. That's what Joshua is told. And but in Exodus 3, it's the angel of the Lord that appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of the bush that wasn't consumed. So one intertextual connection after another. Okay, so Gugu Bruce says, why are some scriptures which show Jesus' deity disputed by some? I'm thinking primarily of Romans 9, 5. Well, okay, so first of all, in terms of why they would want to is because there are a lot of people that don't want to believe in the deity of Christ. The whole idea that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. First of all, that's a problem for a lot of people because they want God to be manageable. They, they like a deity that is somewhat in their control. Either they can rationally, you know, wrap their minds around him. Uh, this whole idea of controlling him extends well beyond, you know, just manipulating him to do it. You know, you see it with people when they, the, the you know, name it and claim it, right? Trying to get God to do what they want. But people want God to be manageable. They want him to be a pint-sized deity that that they feel like they've got some mastery of, whether it's intellectually or physically or whatever. Well, a lot of these people that are anti-Trinitarians are what are known as rationalists, meaning that they think that the human mind is the measure of truth. If the human mind cannot rationally schematize it, then it can't be true. Whereas Christianity is a religion of divine revelation. We don't believe that God is irrational, but we do believe that God knows things beyond us and can reveal things that in this present situation might appear perplexing to us. We might think that there's a tension and don't know how these things go together. But we know that God is higher than us and prior than us and greater than us. And so if he reveals it to us, 
we can know these things go together because we know that what escapes our gaze doesn't escape his gaze. He, he can figure out, he doesn't have to figure them out literally, right? But he, he knows everything, right? He knows how they all relate. Well, so that's one thing. They just don't like this idea. It's, it's to their minds, a challenge to their intellectual autonomy. It means submitting to God's word, even if it pairs to go, appears to go against my superior wisdom, right? Another thing is they just don't like the idea that God comes into the world, that he gets this close. I mean, there's just all these different things that weigh in on why they would be motivated not to believe in the deity of Christ. And so then when they go to text that assert the deity of Christ, they look for reasons to justify their unbelief. And so one text might have a textual variant, let's say, like some manuscripts might have it a little differently. They will, for the life of them, not go with those variants. They will not go with the best evidence for what this text... I'll give you an example. John 1.1. John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's no relevant variant of that verse until the 9th century. A 9th century manuscript has a variant. Well, Unitarians will latch onto that variant, which has no credibility. It's not considered by scholars a viable variant. It's recognized to be a corruption, right? We have manuscripts from the 9 centuries prior that all read exactly the same way. But a Unitarian will look for anything he can possibly grasp onto to, uh, you know, hold on to in, in support of his false belief. And so in a text like John 1, 1, some of them will go that direction. They'll also chase after a untenable grammatical principle. So some of them will claim this is a point about grammar. Some of them will claim in John 1, 1 that it could mean the word was a God. Now, I can tell you, well, first of all, there's no certain examples of that construction ever meaning a God. But even if there were, the fact of the matter is 90 or 80 percent of the time that construction is definite, meaning the God. Right. The word was the God or 20 percent of the time it's qualitative, meaning the word was God. His very nature is that of deity. There's no certain examples where it could ever mean a God. Okay, but there are some who will say there are some possible exceptions, right? So here's my point. Imagine that there are possible exceptions. Why would you go with possible exceptions when you have 80% and 20% for these other usages, and you know maybe one or two examples of, of a possible usage that doesn't, you know, they're they're showing that they're 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 reading these things in light of their biases in light of their prejudices in light of their agenda they don't want anything to affirm the deity of christ and so they will latch on to those things that have less going for them now when it comes to romans 9 5 what people do there is they they play off of a grammatical ambiguity it is true that, strictly speaking, you could render the verse a couple of different ways, but that doesn't mean that each, each translation is equally credible, because it's not just the grammar of a verse, but it's context that determines it. And one of the problems with rendering Romans 9.5 the way some Unitarians would like, the verse says the best rendering when I say another rendering is possible, I don't mean it's the best way of taking it. The most natural way is taking it to mean that he is, uh, you know, according to the flesh, uh, he's from Israel according to the flesh, who is God over all forever praised. So it's calling him God over all forever praised. So what you have at the end of this is a, is a, a doxology of praise to God. Okay. The way this works in Jewish doxologies doesn't work the way these guys try and render the verse. The way they try to render the verse is something like, um, uh, I forget exactly how they butcher it, but it's like they try and make the verse read that uh, as though it's talking about the Messiah and then suddenly it turns to talk about God and, and gives a doxology. Okay, but that doesn't make any sense if you understand how doxologies work in the Old Testament. Uh, 
there's a good treatment of this in a book by Kamajewski and Bowman, Ed uh, Kamajewski or Ed Bowman and, or excuse me, Robert Bowman and Ed Kamajewski. I've been talking for three and a half hours. Cut me some slack. <laughs> Rob Bowman and Ed Kamajewski have a, have a good treatment of that. Uh, but the, the grammar best supports taking it as calling the Messiah, God over all who's forever praised. And the fact that doxologies don't function the way the Unitarian rendering would have it already makes it contextually impossible. Uh, it's not suddenly turning to a doxology to God in this way, which you just don't find in in Judaism. Uh, but I, I think the best treatment of that, it's been a while, but it, the best treatment is that Ed Kamaj or Ed Rob Bowman and Ed Kamajewski. I hope they're not watching. I don't think they watch, but they are friends. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm. Let's see here. I see Truth Defender says. I survived the powers versus pagan debate, and all I got was this lousy T-shirt. Uh, well, I'm excited to find out what happened with that. Um, Royer says, thank you, Anthony, for such a great teaching. God bless you and your family. Well, I'm glad you guys can put up with me. Sometimes I stutter. Sometimes I stammer. Um, so anybody that wants to put up with it, I do put in a lot of work to get these things out to you. So, uh Oh, so Breakfast Gun also left to watch uh, Sam and Kelly. So that's interesting. Um, so, oh, I forgot uh, that Shamu is a Roman Catholic, right? You're, are you a Roman Catholic? You said you agree with Sam. You agree, but you don't, you don't like um, him. Um, hey, there's Kelly. Maybe Kelly wants to come up. How about I do that? Let me see. I'm going to copy this. Hey, Kelly, uh, here's the link. If you're interested, you might be tired. It's, it's, uh, it's late. Oh, well, there he is. There he is. Booyah. <laughs> Let me just mute one second here. So that way I don't have double feedback there. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? There we go. Hey, what happened? How you doing? I'm here. I see you. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? There it is. You, Yay. You hear and see? I can see now. Wow. Hey, buddy. How's I didn't know you were going tonight. How you doing? Well, yeah. So here's here's the thing. You you uh, bamboozled me um, because originally you guys were scheduled to go on at seven. I thought we did so go I, on at seven. Yeah, you did. Because then I saw later that it said ten. What's well, just ten your time? Because you're three hours ahead. Oh, see, so I'm the I'm the buffoon. I, I bamboozled <laughs> me. I bamboozled me. Um, so then I so I thought I had scheduled my show at a good time that wouldn't interrupt yours and I could watch yours. But then I had misled people yesterday that it was, I thought it's a long story, but I made them think it was yesterday, but it was actually today. And so I couldn't put it off again today. I thought I left time to watch your thing and ended up not being able to do so. Well, anyway, I'm well, good, man. We, well, Hey, how's it going, man? Good, good. So, uh, well, I don't know. What are your thoughts after I haven't seen it yet? What what are your thoughts that you want to share? What have people been saying so far? I, I don't. I haven't seen anything. I mean, one person was being facetious in here. He was trying to talk like Sam. Uh, Kelly ran with his tail between his legs. But, but he, <laughs> he was being facetious. I know. <laughs> Somebody else says, "Legend has it, Sam is still screaming." Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, so yeah, so went on yeah. Sam's channel was, I was on there for about, I think over an hour, maybe an hour 15. I don't know, maybe that long. I'm surprised it lasted that long, to be honest with you. I thought for sure he was going to boot me sooner. 
And um, wait, so, wait, so tell me, did he boot you? No, I left on my own. Uh, so you you left without a blow up? I mean, on his part or? Well, so what happened was um, when we finally were starting to get in a conversation because I asked three questions. I asked the first question I asked was I was trying to lead up to different things, and he kept getting more irritated, as you would know he would, right? Mm -hmm. So he removed me twice from the stream yard, twice, right? And he was trying to play the game, you know, like, this is what you did to me back in the day, blah, 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 right? Whatever, right? So that's fine. Um, but when he kept doing it, he kept saying to his audience, what do you guys think I should do? What do you, should, I, should I bring him back up? Should I get rid of him? This is your guys' time. You know, what should you do? So he did it like about probably three times. And the last time he did it, I was, you know, removed from the stream yard. And I, I've already made the three points. My three points was about challenging him on whose authority is. The second point was for him to define what, what worship is to God, what that looks like. And the third point that I was leading up to is why should we pray to Mary? Because essentially the Bible says we're only to pray to God. And worship is an act of prayer, which I was able to show from different quotes from different Catholic sources, right? So my point was, I got all three points out there, but he was still playing the dance game. And I could just tell that if he didn't boot me at some point, he was going to do it at some, you know, it was coming soon. So I realized, and I said, all right, it's time to go. And so I left on my own. Maybe some people might have said I, he booted me, but no, he didn't boot me. But I left because I realized I needed to shake off the dust and it was time to move on. Oh, very good. I'll, I'll check it out. Um, so, I mean, I, I've said this before, the, the way it works, I, I mean, I know how he works and now he'll know I know how he works, right? Um, but knowing him, he has to assume dominance, right? And if he doesn't have that, then he's not really going to have an interaction with you. There's got to be this sense of you're, you're sort of docile, humble, submitted, right? And if he doesn't establish that at the beginning, then it, it, it's going to be this, uh, I'm still listening. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's going to be this thing where he's like, you know, playing the game. Do you want me to get rid of you? Should I keep him? He's, he's hoping people will give him the excuse. And so that he'll say, oh, yeah, see, you wanted me to get rid of him, right? He, he, he's, he thinks too much of his own ego and all the rest that uh, that's just how he operates. But um, that's why it's problematic to just do it on his channel, though I understand why you would, because you're not going to get him to easily have a conversation with you in some other context, because, again, how do you establish dominance if you don't have some, you know, button that you can push, right? If, I mean, this is, you know, the way it works here, you know, you, you got to be able to silence a person, mute them, whatever. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah. Anyway, so it was interesting. So like, so what I did um, just to share with you and, and when you get a chance to, you know, listen to it, watch it later or whatever. Uh, yeah. Let me know your thoughts. Like I had, um, I had a threefold kind of, what I was, was wanting to get the conversation to go even longer um, was really just because it was supposed to be on Mariology. And, you know, he was baiting me this last week, throwing jabs in his different streams, saying that I was a Bible butcher, heretic, false teacher, prideful, arrogant, can't debate, don't know the Bible, all this stuff. But before, like, you know, we talked about this, he was saying all these great things and, you know, I'm not going to, you know, attack him anymore. I'm not going to say this and all that. But then after I went on his channel last Tuesday asking for, you know, basically like just a good general discussion Well, this whole week, he's been telling people to pray for him that he would, you know, you know, obliviate me, destroy me, crush me, you know, all these things. But then um, he was saying, you know, I, I wrote all these articles or I got these articles for William or I got these things from Catholic answer or whatever. Right. And I'm like, well, that's, that's great. Right. But my focus was, it was kind of like when he first came on my channel back in like 2021, one of the, one of the questions I asked him that kind of what I went back to is why do you pray to Mary? That's what, that was one of my questions about the Marian doctrines when he first came on the first time. And I went right back to it and it's hilarious because he couldn't answer it. Right. And that was his problem because he's put all this stock, if you will, about praying to Mary and, you know, all this, if you don't believe the Marian doctrines and you are a blasphemer, you are uh, an attacker, an opposer of the church. So he's put so much on Mary. And so I, I just basically said, hey, I, I did it real. Well, where, where's that at? 
where's it at? And uh, he couldn't, he couldn't do it. He started playing his game, his control. And when I realized I, I made my points and if anyone who's honest goes to his channel, would at least consider what it was shared. Hopefully there was some seeds planted. Mm -hmm. So did he give any positive arguments for a prayer to Mary? Nothing. Not did in my he opinion. He, 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 uh, he talked about, well, saints can pray for us. I said, yeah, praying for us is different than praying to them. Two and four are different. If I mm -hmm. asked you, people know you by Anthony, but I say Tony, people get mixed up. But anyway, if I asked you to pray for me, you could pray for me, but who are you going to pray to? You're going to pray to God. You're going to pray to the triune God. If someone asked me, hey, Kelly, can you pray for me? I can pray for them, but I'm going to pray to God. That's the difference, the two and the four. Big, yeah. big difference. Yeah, You know, it's, it's funny. So they're not very consistent. And I know you're not surprised to hear me say that. And you're not learning something when I say that. <laughs> you knew this already. But but here's what's interesting. So oftentimes they'll try and appeal to the interpersonal relationships that Christians have here on earth as warrant for their claims about what's true of us in relation to saints in heaven. So they'll say, you know, we can ask other saints to pray for us. So that's supposed to legitimate them. Pray. You know, what they mean is you can go to your church and you can ask your fellow parishioner to pray for you. That's true, right? Right. right that's true. And, and he can respond to you and tell you, I'm going to pray for you. Right. Yes. yes. Now. Why isn't it then, notice they're not consistent here with this analogy, it's because you can allegedly go and speak to your fellow Christian here on earth, uh, and there, therefore you're supposed to be able to do that towards somebody that's in heaven. Well, it's also the case that the person you speak to at your church can talk back to you. Why aren't they, you know, having a conversation with Mary, right? Th that's just not how it works. Why not? Why is there this disjunct between these two things? And, and, and if, okay, so here's this, there's, there's a disanalogous relationship. In other words, you're not presently having a conversation with Mary, right? Uh, or the other saints. So why, if we're not having, okay, the, remember the argument is if you can talk to somebody at your church, then you can talk to somebody in heaven. Mm -hmm. okay? Well, if you're now going to say, well, they don't, the, the saints in heaven don't talk to us here on earth, then why can't I go the further direction and say, okay, then we can't pray to them either, right? I mean, just saying the whole logic of it breaks down. But that's why there's no surprise that none of that stuff is found in the Word of God. And there's no actual necessary inference that leads to it. There's no expression of prayers to Mary. There's no inference that leads to prayers to Mary. And you'd expect if she was a fit or appropriate recipient of prayer that it would be said somewhere. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. Why is this utterly missing from the piety of Completely the apostles and bankrupt. the churches? Right. Yeah. Why would they say nothing about any of this that's so central to their religious worship? Right. Yeah. That's I mean, that's that that was the key. Like. I wanted to give Sam the benefit of the doubt. I really I, I'm actually like I was actually going into his realm, his dungeon, his kingdom, if you will, on his channel wanting to get his perspective because a lot of times I even ask him, what do you believe about how does one worship God? How do you worship God? And he tried to dance around, do this and that, what the words different, we you know, uh, proscono and Latreia and different words, how these things mean. And, um, but I was trying to ask him directly, right? I even asked him, I said, Romans 12, uh, two, one and two talks about that. Paul says, I urge you by the mercies of God to present your, bodies um a holy and living sacrifice which is your spiritual act of worship i said to sam how do you live that out and they started playing games on you know words or whatever right like he couldn't answer it directly like if you ask me how am i living up my spiritual life every day well i fellowship with other christians i pray throughout the day i read the word of god i have a born again wife we talk about spiritual things um i listen to different things online different sermons i at times I'll go for a walk and I observe creation and I'm, I'm praising God for it. Um, I'm wanting to be a witness to people at my job, my secular job right now to be an example. And I live in a very weird environment that everybody knows I'm a Christian, but they all live like hell and it's funny. Um, but so I'm, I'm living that out. What does it mean to live out our Christian faith on a daily basis of worshiping God? Right. And he couldn't answer those basic questions things right and th and and i was pointing that that was a you know a point to go to the next point of, about mary because um can i sh let me see if i can find the right one here real quick um 
if I can share something here real quick with you. Uh, yeah. Can I share something with you real quick? Yeah. Do I have to do uh, I mean, I don't normally have others on, so I might. Let's see if I can find it real quick. It, I guess. Let's see if I can. Here we go. Here it is. All right. Let's see if that's visible. Okay. So here it is here. And you can see that. I'll try to can I make it bigger. Let's see. No, I can't, can't see that because I'm blind. Well, that's as big as I can get it, apparently. Well, Sorry. I can well, I'll, I'll read it to you. So this is I'll a look. prayer I... from EWTN.com. So obviously it's a Catholic website. And this here is talking, it's about a prayer consecration to Mary. And it says, um, I'm just going to read the underlined part. I won't read the whole thing, but it talks about, we consecrate ourselves to thine immaculate heart. We consecrate to thee our very being and our whole life. All that we have, all that we love, all that we are to thee, we give our bodies, our hearts and our souls. To thee, we give our whole. Sounds like Deuteronomy 6 to the wrong yeah, person. Yeah, I mean, we, and who, who do you need God for when you got Mary, right? Our families, our country. We desire that all that is in us and around us may belong to thee, right? And the end of the, the quote at the bottom here, it says, Finally, we promise thee, O glorious mother, our loving mother of men, to devote ourselves wholeheartedly to the service of thy blessed cult. I mean, so this is a prayer that is regular and normal uh, in, uh, you know, for, for Catholics, right? Let me share this other one here too with you real quick. This is just, um, this is from Bishop Allegory, which is, you know, is a, in the Catholic church, a saint, he's a doctor, you know, he's a the theologian, one of the top guys for them, glories of Mary. Let me just read a few of the unlined quotes here pertaining to Mary. He was truly obliged to obey her. But of Mary alone can it be said that she was far favored as not to only herself submissive to the will of God, but even that God was subject to her will. God was subject to her will. At the command of Mary, all obey, even God. She is omnipotent, for the queen, according to all laws, enjoys the same privileges as the king. And since the son's power also belongs to the mother, this mother is made omnipotent by her omnipotent son. And one more quick quote, same book, Glories of Mary. This is chapter uh, 6, uh, paragraph 2. The other one was chapter, uh, paragraph six, chapter, uh, paragraph, chapter 6, paragraph 1. Here it says, We have many reasons for the loving, this truly lovable queen, that if Mary were praised all over the world, if all preachers spoke about her alone, and if all human beings laid down their lives for her, it would be little compared with honor and thanks we owe her for the tender love she feels for all. Even for the most desperate sinners who happen to have the slightest spark of devotion to her, she is the singular refuge of the abandoned the hope of the miserable and the advocate of every sinner who turns to her. I mean, that is just absolute heresy. Hmm. You know, both of you or both of us used to witness to Mormons a lot. Some of my viewers may not know that I know you from back in the nineties, right? We, met back in the mid nineties and used to do some witnessing together and so forth, hung out together until we both, I don't remember exactly when we parted ways, like you went one way and I went another, but it, it, yeah, it I moved a long to time Canada ago. with my wife. Uh, we recently got married and, uh, went to Canada. I think it was like 2001. I think you moved shortly after that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that, yeah. So it's, it was like 20 years later than that we reconnected. But anyways, we, we have a long at least did uh, a lot of street witnessing. It was fun. Yeah. And I remember when I was first learning about Mormons, I remember hearing some very repugnant things. If you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you love his truth and so forth. Then when you hear some of those things for the first time, you think, Whoa, wait, what a minute. Wait. Uh, I remember hearing them talk about God, the father being a physical man, having relations with Mary Yep. producing Jesus. And I, I was so repulsed by that. I thought, how can these people even pretend that that's Christian? And I, 
I always thought, you know, there were, there were times when I was doing apologetic stuff. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, you know, I, I almost want to not read some of this because I don't want to be desensitized <laughs> to it. I want it to always be repulsive to me. Right. Yes. And, and no matter, I mean, I'm, I'm thankful to the Lord, you know, when I, when you, even when you're reading that, I mean, I've read Alphonsus Liguri, I've got <laughs> stuff from him and other Roman Catholics. One of the statements that Liguri makes similar to one you read is where he talks about the fact that, or claim that Mary's the one who dispenses the spirit, right? She's the one who gives the Holy Spirit. You can't have the Holy Spirit unless Mary gives the Holy Spirit to you. This this sort of stuff and how she has sovereign dominion over the, the dispensing of the spirit. Uh, and no matter how many times I hear that stuff, it, it never strikes me as anything less than utterly abhorrent. And, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. But uh, so, well, that's good that you got some of those things out there and uh, it's crazy. So, no. So I, I thought that the discussion was supposed to be on her per, alleged perpetual virginity, but it was more. Broad. So when I asked him, I just said Mariology. He assumed oh, okay. it was perpetual virginity. That's what he was stalking everything on. Mm. And that was, that was his problem, not mine. <laughs> huh? Yeah, I wonder what the agenda there was. I mean, part of it might be that this is this is sort of like you might consider it the gateway drug. Like it's easier for people to swallow the perpetual virginity pill than the immaculate conception queen of heaven pill and co-mediatrix, yeah. co-redemptrix pill. But if you can loosen their grip, maybe they'll eventually be willing to take these uh, these other ideas on board. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I was showing like after I left and I went back to my 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 channel because I was live streaming his uh stuff um uh, on my channel i uh had to figure out a way to do where i just kind of put the volume really low um and then was able to step back where what the feedback wasn't there apparently so it somehow worked so i wanted to make sure that was also on my channel and um yeah like when the whole thing when he was there like you know when i first talked to him my focus was like, look, let's let's talk about Mariology in general. But he had an agenda. He wanted to focus on perpetual virginity or other things like that, right? That was what he, I noticed in his streams. Now, look, me and you've even talked like if, if Mary was an ever virgin, right? Meaning like she never had union with anyone else ever. And say Joseph potentially had children with someone else prior. Maybe he was a widow or something like that or whatever. That doesn't do anything to our faith. Right. That, that that doesn't change anything. Right. But when you mention or teach the doctrine that she was born without sin. Right. That she is, you know, stainless, sinless. That's an unbiblical doctrine. That's that's a very counter uh, what the scriptures teach, being the all holy one and things like that. And then the fact even the body the assumption, the, the assumption of Mary. Right. No big deal. If that was true, Elijah and um, and, and Enoch taken up. Hey, whatever. That's wonderful. So those are two things I don't bank on, right? Those are not, I know they're both unbiblical, but I don't put a lot of stock in it. The ones that I focus on is the issue of um, uh, immaculate conception and then her being an advocate or a mediatrix, which are both heretical because it teaches a different gospel. It replaces, it pretty much makes Mary the Holy Spirit. And that's the problem. Yeah, in fact, um, while on the one hand, for us, those doctrines you mentioned, like perpetual virginity or bodily assumption, while for us, those are, you know, tangential in a sense, if they were true, it wouldn't, it wouldn't change anything, right? It might be like, uh, I don't know, moving a chair around in your living room. It's not the same thing as changing houses, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but in the Roman system, those things are necessary because they're part of the overall package of uh, exalting and, and making Mary more. And, and, and a lot of it stems from some of the early mistakes that were made. For example, Jerome, he, he thought that Mary needed to be a perpetual vir virgin because there was something more holy about the virginal estate. And so if you need Mary to be really holy, then you need her to be really a virgin, right? So... So for Jerome, there was something riding on it. But for us, you know, and some Roman Catholics today will say, oh, we don't believe that or whatever. Well, you know, this is the momentum was was picked up by people from people like Jerome who very much, you know, castigated marriage, put it down 
and made it to be a, a, a lesser uh, state. So for them, it means a whole lot more. She can't really be all that they need her to be as the one they look to, you know, the way you read Liguri, right? The, the one they yeah. look to for all their life and their nourishment and their whatever. Um, so yeah, it's, it's extra virgin olive oil. Oh, so um, <laughs> Breakfast Gun said, you're not going to believe this, but I actually heard this Breakfast Gun. Somebody mentioned it earlier. So uh, I have already heard and I, you might, ha you might want to rewind and hear what I said about that because uh, I mean, just, just, if you're interested at all, but um, so you mentioned that Sam issued another challenge. I mentioned that I went after these guys for a year and a half and I got nothing but silence on the other end. And, you know, I had to constantly, you know, listen as these guys made up lies. Like I didn't even care to put out all those lies that they were telling. I mean, some people can tell you there was uh, there were other people that were more interested in defending my name than I was. Right. So Steve Christie, for example, who goes by Born Again RN, he put out a video proving that William had lied about uh, trying to debate with me and, and me not being the one that was setting on a date. It was William all the way through. And then Sam lied for William. Th those guys have no shame. Right. I didn't I wasn't even interested in putting out all the evidence. But Born Again RN went on his own and he took some of the stuff and he, he went and put it up. And there was a whole lot more besides. But, uh, you know, so. I chased those guys for a year and a half. They didn't want to do it. And now all of a sudden they do, right? Because I said, I'm not interested in chasing them anymore. Well, I, I even said, though, I'm willing, I'm willing, but not under the terms that he's insisting on, right? He said that it has to be me and another person against him and William. Right. And I've said that it's me and him or me against him and William. Okay? And I know neither one of those things are going to happen. Right. He's not going to debate me without William on the issue of Mary. And he's, uh, you know, and, and with William, here's the other thing. I said that the, the issue I'm interested in debating is Rome's false doctrines in their Roman or Eastern context. Because according to Rome in the East, these are day fide day doctrines. You must believe these things to be saved, part of the true right. church. Right. That's what he needs to defend. I don't care about his other trifles, right? He needs to defend the Mariolatry angle on this, which is this over-exaltation of Mary, making her a substitute for Christ, just like the Pope thinks he's a substitute for Christ, an altar Christus. Yeah. Yeah, well, one of the things that's even, um, where is it over here? There it is there. Let me pop this on the screen real quick again for you. This is interesting because this is one of the reasons why um, also this is an important discussion. So this is from um, Pope Pius XII from uh, November 1st, 1950. There's a lot there, but these are some of the highlighted things. And so I'll just read out for some of the people can't read it or not. This is the, this is the biggest I can get it here. Um, on number four, it says, uh, and two things are dogmas. Uh, in this particular statement that are here, um, one, the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption of Mary. So here it says, number four, the privilege has shown forth a new radiance since our predecessor of immortal memory, Pius IX solemnly proclaimed the dogma of the loving mother of God's Immaculate Conception. So that's one of those there. Number five, now God has willed that the Blessed Virgin Mary should be exempted from this general rule, she by entirely unique privilege, completely overcame sin by her immaculate conception. I'd like to know how she overcame sin by her immaculate. That'd be cool. As a result, she was not subject to the law of remaining in the corruption of the grave, and she did not have to wait until the end of time for the redemption of her body. So this is pointing to the assumption of Mary. Number six. Thus, when it was solemnly proclaimed that Mary, the Virgin of Mary, was from the very beginning free from the taint of original sin, the minds of the faithful were filled with a stronger hope that the day might soon come when the dogma of the Virgin's Mary bodily assumption into heaven would also be defined by the Church's supreme teaching authority. So in this statement here, we have the dogma of the Immaculate Conception and here in the dogma of the bodily assumption. Number 47, it is forbidden to any man to change this, our declaration or pronouncement and definition, or by rash attempt 
to oppose or counter it. If any man should presume to make such an attempt, let him know that he will incur the wrath of the Almighty God and of the blessed apostles, Peter and Paul. So there you clearly see how much they've put now into their dogmas of the two things there for sure. And if you reject them or come against them, you are going to receive the wrath of God. And not only that, but Peter and Paul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, the, that last part is, is more than humorous because you'd think if you're going to receive the wrath of God, then, you know, what's the necessary addition of Peter and Paul there for? I mean, excuse me if I say that, you know, the wrath of Peter and Paul don't really mean much after being told the wrath of God would fall, right? Huh? Um, but it's, it's just part of their overall exaltation of saints in a way that the Bible doesn't say and demotion of God in the process. You know, his wrath apparently isn't sufficient to uh, be threatening enough. You got to bring in Peter and Paul. But, you know, I was thinking the, the statement where, it says that Mary, as a unique or singular privilege for her alone, right, was exempted from X, Y, yes. and Z. Uh, you know, when they talk like, I mean, what they're doing is, of course, when you go to the Bible and you see that it says people are sinners, well, you're allowed to exempt Mary because they've said, right, they've said that she's exempt from this. She's unique, right? So when it says everybody sinned, not Mary, she's exempt. Well, by that kind of thing, you could also say Mary floated two inches off the ground. She never touched the ground, right? <laughs> and somebody says, well, wait a minute. It says everybody, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, subject to the laws that God has put in place, right? Everybody walks on the ground or whatever. And you say, oh, no, Mary, unique, singular privilege only for her alone, right? You know, prove, prove me wrong. You know, and then every time you go to a passage that shows, you know, what might look like evidence, uh, uh, they're, they're going to say, uh, you know, they're going to make some excuse, you know, like, well, maybe that was Joseph's other wife's feet that were on the ground. And, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just I'm being silly at this point. But I mean, I think their whole religious piety is silly. Let and me show it, this to you. It's oh, the, oh, keep going. Keep going. You, know, you can pull it up while I'm saying that. But so this is also something else that's crazy. So look at this here. So I'm going to show a few quotes here. This is on this. So this is so how, how hilarious. When I was asking early on, Sam, who's his authority? And he, I said, you know, outside the Bible, because you're neither, you're neither Orthodox, you're <laughs> neither Roman Catholic. So who's your authority? And he kind of was trying to appeal to the church fathers. And he was appealing to, you know, 1 Timothy 3.15 about how the church is the pillar, you know, and of truth and all that. But that doesn't, that doesn't teach anything about the, the church fathers. It's absolutely 100% ridiculous, right? And I called him on that. So interesting, though, is if you were to look at Pope Leo the Great, which was one of the popes, and if you look at um, St. Ambrose and also Clement of Alexandria, these are just some, just some. Uh, I'll just read the underlined parts here pertaining to Mary. Because as our Lord, the destroyer of sin and death, finds none free from charge, so is he who come to free us all. For the Son of God in the fullness of time, which the inscrutable depth of the divine counsel has determined, has taken on him the nature of man. So talking about his incarnation, right? Might be conquered through that nature which he had conquered. So again, talking about his incarnation. For the Almighty Lord enters this list with the savage foe, not in his own majesty, but in our humility, opposing him with the same form and same nature, which shares indeed our mortality. Though it is free from all sin. So talking how about Jesus, of course, is without sin. Truly foreign to this nativity, meaning the birth of Jesus, is that which we read of all others. All others. No one is clean from stain. Not even the infant who has lived but one day upon the earth. This is Pope Leo the Great. Here's another one. That was Sermon 21. Here's Sermon 22. And I have links. For, these are all from the New Advent. Goes on here. Um, Should believe him born in no different way to others. For when he observed that his nature, talking about Satan, when he observed his nature was like that of all others, he thought that he had the same origin as us, as all had. And did not understand that he was free from the bonds of transgression. So this is 
Satan didn't know this because he could find him a, could not find him a stranger to the weakness of mortality. And to this end, without male seed, Christ was conceived of a virgin who was, there's that word I pronounced last time wrong, um, fecundated, which talks about being a physical union between a, a man and a woman, not by human intercourse, but by the Holy Spirit. Whereas, look at this, whereas all other mothers, conception does not take place without the stain of sin. That would include Mary's mother. Here, St. Ambrose states, talking about, I don't want to read the whole thing here, but this is from on the Holy Spirit, chapter 9, 111, or 111. This indeed was divine in him that his flesh did no sin, nor did the creature of the body take in him sin. For what wonder would it be that the God had alone sinned not, seeing it had no incentives to sin? But if God alone is freed from sin, certainly every creature by its own nature can be, as we have said, liable to sin. That's St. Ambrose. Clement of Alexandria states, in reference to the Son, who is sinless, blameless, devoid of passion, God in the form of man, stainless. So talking about Jesus here. He is to us a spotless image. He is wholly free from human passions. Wherefore also he alone is judged because he alone is sinless. So these are just some. Clement of Alexandria, Pope, a Pope even said this, and Ambrose. So if someone like Sam wants to appeal to church authority, church fathers, even popes or whatever, well, then what do you do with these guys? What do you do with these guys? Well, I can't hear you. You're muted. Yeah, I muted myself because I had, so I'm not usually on this late and I have an alarm on my phone that reminds me of something at one and it was going off. So I had to tell it to be quiet. <laughs> um, yeah. So what do you think about those quotes? I mean, you may be familiar with some of those already, but I mean, those are quotes from them that are giving the affirmation that only Jesus was the ever one who was ever born without sin. Yeah. So, I mean, it's well known that certain fathers were very clearly not advocating what was later taught by Rome at uh, their, you know, sundry councils like Vatican II and so forth. But, um, well, Tertullian and Chrysostom are two of the most notable that don't seem to go easy on Mary's, uh, you know, failings at certain points. But, um, you know, it's interesting going back to what started all that was you asking what his authority is when he says the church father. See, here, here's the problem. He's not being true to either East or, or the Orthodox because it, it's not just that you need something additional to scripture for information like the church fathers. You need to know how to sift through both of those. You don't know how to interpret the Bible without these groups, according to them. Yeah. And you don't know what counts as truly apostolic tradition just by looking at the church fathers you have to learn from them what the true yep. apostolic tradition is and so that's why you know i mean how else rome can't get off the ground without that kind of thing because one problem you have for example take the bodily assumption the first person you get referring to that is is remarkably late right and it doesn't mean that if it's early it's true i'm just saying that for them these have to be apostolic traditions so you need to find precedent for them in earlier times you can't just make them up and then say, oh, well, they were taught by the apostles, right? Because, right. But, but that's what, so Rome does need to do that, though, because they don't have a lot of their doctrines as early as they need them. And so, so for example, Robertson Genis, he's admitted there's, there's nothing really about Mary's bodily assumption in the first, right. second, he's a, yeah. third, fourth, right? So he, he admits that, but that's, it doesn't matter to him because he's got the authority of Rome. Puts it all right? in the Catholic Church. You're right. Right. So Rome is necessary in their system for knowing what Scripture is, for authenticating Scripture, giving it its authority, and interpreting it. And Rome is necessary to tell you what traditions of the fathers count and what count what don't count. Yeah. Right. And so he's he's kind of a lone ranger out there. He he doesn't. And that's really what I said to him. I said, well, you know, you you can't play uh, you know church fathers buffet. That's what I said to him. I said, you just can't pick and choose which ones you want and say, well, this is authoritative. 
Because then if you're going to claim these guys teach such and such that backs up what you believe right now, because he tried to use, he started off with water baptism, saying like, you know, all the early church fathers all affirmed water baptism regeneration. I said, well, that's fine. That's fine. If that's what they believe, I don't agree with it. He says, would you say that's heretical? I said, yeah. I said, that's not what the Bible teaches. So we, he, kind of, he kind of tried to shift the discussion for a while on that. And he goes, well, all, all of them taught that. I said, well, I haven't read them all, so I can't say all of them actually taught that. So I can't affirm that. I said, but are you saying that because you're appealing this, all the church fathers are inspired? And so he couldn't answer that, right? He didn't answer that. Because if you're going to appeal to that additional to this, then you have to claim that they're inspired because they have to be on the same authority, right? And he couldn't answer that. He had to try. He, 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 he avoided that like the plague. And that's where yeah. he, he started slowly breaking down there. I, I wish I had kept it, but uh, he was the guy only about a year ago who said uh, the, the extent of his reading and study in the past was chick tracks and <laughs> i remember that he admitted that uh he hasn't been reading the fathers and he assumed that if he hadn't been then i hadn't been right and anyways though but the, you know for him now to say they all taught it you know he's he's yeah. that he's assumes he's read them all and he hasn't yeah yeah I mean, I, I could say they, they didn't all teach it because all, it doesn't take me having read all of them to know that this one or that one did right. reject it. Or, yeah. Well, and that was one thing I mentioned to him. I said, well, I, I've read many church fathers talk about just trusting in Jesus for salvation. Mm -hmm. I said, they don't all every time talking about the gospel mention water baptism. So that's you have to read into that what you want it to say. Yeah. Plus, there's there's a failure. I mean, I'm not saying that this is what explains all references, but when you do get people referring to this notion, sometimes it's just the language of scripture, which, for example, it, I use this as, as an example, even though it's about the Lord's Supper, just because it, I think it's easier for people to wrap their head around. But in scripture, a sign is often put for the reality. So, for example, Jesus said, you have to eat his flesh and drink his blood or you have no life in you. Right. Right. Well, yeah. in the same context, he explains what it means to feed on him. You correct. Believe in him, right. Come to him. It's, it's, it's repeatedly stated there. And by the way, Augustine says this as well. This is how you feed on Christ through faith. Right. So it's not a carnal eating. In fact, that was the mistake made by those people that were there. They exactly. said, how are you going to give us your flesh to eat? And then Jesus says, my, you know, things like my, my words are spirit and their yeah. life. Right. And he clarified it. True. Yeah. yeah. He, he makes it very clear, but, but here's the point. The sign is being put for the reality. And it's sort of like if I hold up a picture of my wife and kids and I say, look, this is my wife and kids. Now imagine a smart Alex saying, oh, so your wife is two dimensional and, uh, <laughs> they, they fit inside your wallet or, you know what I mean? No, I'm, I'm, I'm holding up a picture of them but yeah. when i say this is my wife these are my kids i mean this represents them this correct pictures them right correct and so similarly jesus just like had been done throughout the old testament jesus took certain things and used them as pictures as symbols as signs now that's not reducing these things as to bear you know rituals i do believe god can use these things in ways sanctifying ways and so forth uh so we do talk about sanctifying grace and that at least i in our my context we do it but that doesn't mean that they are the things that they you know if it if jesus holds up the bread and he says this is my body right i don't run to the conclusion oh he's literally holding his his body in his own bodily hand right any more than I think that the cup that he held up was literally the new covenant, because he also said this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Right. No Roman Catholic believes that they think that the content of the cup becomes his body, blood, soul and divinity. Exactly. But notice the literal language. The cup, this cup is the new covenant. Yeah. Right. If you follow their logic out, this is my body means it literally is his body. Well, then you have to say the cup literally is the new covenant. Right. Yes. If you don't allow metaphors in one place, why allow it in the other? Right. And Jesus constantly spoke in this way throughout John's gospel, in fact. Uh, and th the problem with the people that were on the wrong side of things was always that they were understanding him in a crude, carnal way. Right. Destroy this temple. Oh, he wants us to destroy the 
you know, temple made of bricks right. over here. Right. You know, uh, you know, you must be born again. Oh, he wants us to go back into our mother's wombs, you know. Oh, eat right. my oh, he wants us to literally. And in, in each of those fingers. times, he always clarifies, like you're saying. Yeah. 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 Well, it's probably late for you. Thanks for having me on, bud. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad it was what it was. And um, I think it was a victory, in my opinion. Jared says, um, Anthony knows better than 1,500 years of Christianity. <laughs> man, it's awesome. So Jared knows how to beg the question more than anybody uh, else. He's, he's been history. slandering me since I got here, it looks like. So he's, he's one of oh. my favorites, I can tell. Well, see, here's the funny thing. So I say he's question begging because the whole point that I've just been making is that Rome's errors are not you know, the, the pure truth coming down from the apostles. Uh, and I've, I've demonstrated this numerous times. There's numerous things that Rome and the East no longer believe that earlier fathers did. And there's numerous things that they teach now that the fathers never did. Correct. Right? Both directions. Yeah. And in any case, even though I do that, what I do is not because I'm suggesting my authority is anything other than scripture, but only to show you guys on your own alleged grounds your positions just aren't true. The fact is that Rome and the East don't often ag always agree with the fathers. So yeah, it's true. They're just obedient children. Um, before I take off, great seeing you, man. Um, Got to get you back on my channel one of these days. It'd be fun. So, yeah. yeah. All righty. Well, I'm going to yeah. let you go, and I'm yeah. going to let me go. And yeah. So Anybody wants to check out that debate, um, some people might not know who I am. It's, I have the channel called Berean Perspective Apologetics. Uh, just look up Sam Shimon and Kelly Powers today on your search engine or whatever. You'll see it pop up and all that goodness. So anyway, Lord bless, brother. Great talking with you. All right. You too. Everybody else and out there too. Talk to you later. Lord bless all of you. God bless. Talk to you later.